Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain Chapter 12 Sounding when the river is very low, and one steamboat is drawing all the water there is in the channel, or a few inches more, as was often the case in the old times, one must be painfully circumspect in his piloting. We used to have to sound a number of particularly bad places almost every trip when the river was at a very low stage. Sounding is done in this way. The boat ties up at the shore, just above the shoal crossing. The pilot, not on watch, takes his cub or steersman, and a picked crew of men, sometimes an officer also, and goes out in the yawl, provided the boat has not that rare and sumptuous luxury, a regularly devised sounding boat, and proceeds to hunt for the best water. The pilot on duty watches his movements through a spy-glass, meantime, and in some instances assisting by signals of the boat's whistle, signifying, try higher up, or try lower down for the surface of the water, like an oil-painting, is more expressive and intelligible when inspected from a little distance than very close at hand. The whistle-signals are seldom necessary, however. Never, perhaps, except when the wind confuses the significant ripples upon the water's surface. When the yawl has reached the shoal-place, the speed is slackened, the pilot begins to sound the depth with a pole ten or twelve feet long, and the steersman at the tiller obeys the order to hold her up to starboard, or let her fall off the larboard. Footnote. The term larboard is never used at sea now, to signify the left hand, but was always used on the river in my time. Or, steady, steady as you go. When the measurements indicate that the yawl is approaching the shoalest part of the reef, the command is given to ease all. Then the men stop rowing, and the yawl drifts with the current. The next order is, stand by with the buoy. The moment the shallowest point is reached, the pilot delivers the order, let go the buoy, and over she goes. If the pilot is not satisfied, he sounds the place again. If he finds better water higher up or lower down, he removes the buoy to that place. Being finally satisfied, he gives the order, and all the men stand their oars straight up in the air in line. A blast from the boat's whistle indicates that the signal has been sent. Then the men give way on their oars, and lay the yawl alongside the buoy. The steamer comes creeping carefully down, is pointed straight at the buoy, husbands her power for the coming struggle, and presently, at the critical moment, turns on all her steam, and goes grinding and wallowing over the buoy and the sand, and gains the deep water beyond. Or maybe she doesn't. Maybe she strikes and swings. Then she has to while away several hours, or days, sparring herself off. Sometimes a buoy is not laid at all, but the yawl goes ahead, hunting the best water, and the steamer follows along in its wake. Often there is a deal of fun and excitement about sounding, especially if it is a glorious summer day, or a blustering night. But in winter the cold and the peril take most of the fun out of it. A buoy is nothing but a board four or five feet long, with one end turned up. It is a reversed schoolhouse bench, with one of the supports left and the other removed. It is anchored on the shoalest part of the reef by a rope with a heavy stone made fast to the end of it. But for the resistance of the turned-up end of the reversed bench, the current would pull the buoy under water. At night a paper lantern with a candle in it is fastened on the top of the buoy, and this can be seen a mile or more, a little glimmering spark in the waste of blackness. Nothing delights a cub so much as an opportunity to go out sounding. There is such an air of adventure about it. Often there is danger. It is so gaudy and man-of-war-like to sit up in the stern sheets and steer a swift yawl. There is something fine about the exultant spring of the boat when an experienced old sailor crew throw their souls into the oars. It is lovely to see the white foam stream away from the bows. There is music in the rush of the water. It is deliciously exhilarating in summer to go speeding over the breezy expanses of the river when the world of wavelets is dancing in the sun. It is such grandeur, too, to the cub, to get a chance to give an order. For often the pilot will simply say, Let her go about, 
and leave the rest to the cub, who instantly cries in his sternest tone of command, "'Ease starboard! Strong on the larboard! Starboard give way! With a will, men!' The cub enjoys sounding for the further reason that the eyes of the passengers are watching all the yawl's movements with absorbing interest, if the time be daylight. And if it be night he knows that those same wondering eyes are fastened upon the yawl's lantern as it glides out into the gloom and dims away in the remote distance. One trip a pretty girl of sixteen spent her time in our pilot-house with her uncle and aunt, every day and all day long. I fell in love with her. So did Mr. Thornburg's cub, Tom G. Tom and I had been bosom friends until this time, but now a coolness began to arise. I told the girl a good many of my river adventures, and made myself out a good deal of a hero. Tom tried to make himself appear to be a hero, too, and succeeded to some extent. But then he always had a way of embroidering. However, virtue is its own reward so I was a barely perceptible trifle ahead in the contest. About this time something happened which promised handsomely for me. The pilots decided to sound the crossing at the head of twenty-one. This would occur about nine or ten o'clock at night, when the passengers would still be up. It would be Mr. Thornburg's watch, therefore my chief would have to do the sounding. We had a perfect love of a sounding-boat, long, trim, graceful, and as fleet as a greyhound. Her thwarts were cushioned. She carried twelve oarsmen. One of the mates was always sent in her to transmit orders to her crew, for ours was a steamer where no end of style was put on. We tied up at the shore above twenty-one, and got ready. It was a foul night, and the river was so wide there that a landsman's uneducated eyes could discern no opposite shore through such a gloom. The passengers were alert and interested. Everything was satisfactory. As I hurried through the engine-room, picturesquely gotten up in storm-toggery, I met Tom, and could not forbear delivering myself of a mean speech. "'Ain't you glad you don't have to go out sounding?' Tom was passing on, but he quickly turned and said, "'Now, just for that, you can go and get the sounding-pole yourself. I was going after it, but I'd see you in Halifax now, before I'd do it. Who wants you to get it? I don't. It's in the sounding-boat. It ain't either.' It's been new-painted, and it's been up on the ladies' cabin guards two days, drying." I flew back, and shortly arrived among the crowd of watching and wondering ladies, just in time to hear the command, "'Give way, men!' I looked over, and there was the gallant sounding boat booming away, the unprincipled Tom presiding at the tiller, and my chief sitting by him with a sounding-pole, which I had been sent on a fool's errand to fetch. Then that young girl said to me, Oh, how awful to have to go out in that little boat on such a night! Do you think there is any danger?" I would rather have been stabbed. I went off full of venom to help in the pilot-house. By and by the boat's lantern disappeared, and after an interval a wee spark glimmered upon the face of the water a mile away. Mr. Thornburg blew the whistle in acknowledgment, backed the steamer out, and made for it. We flew along for a while, then slackened steam, and went cautiously gliding toward the spark. Presently Mr. Thornburg exclaimed, "'Hello! The buoy's lantern's out!' He stopped the engines. A moment or two later he said, "'Why, there it is again!' So he came ahead on the engines once more, and rang for the leads. Gradually the water shoaled up, and then began to deepen again. Mr. Thornburg muttered, "'Well, I don't understand this. I believe that buoy has drifted off the reef.' seems to be a little too far to the left. No matter, it is safest to run over it anyhow. So in that solid world of darkness we went creeping down on the light. Just as our bows were in the act of ploughing over it, Mr. Thornburg seized the bell-ropes, rang a startling peal, and exclaimed, "'My soul, it's the sounding-boat!' A sudden chorus of wild alarms burst out far below, a pause, and then the sound of grinding and crashing followed. Mr. Thornburg exclaimed, "'There! The paddle-wheel has ground the sounding-boat to lucifer matches. Run! See who is killed!' I was on the main deck in the twinkling of an eye. My chief and the third mate, and nearly all the men, were safe. They had discovered their danger when it was too late to pull out of the way. Then, when the great guards overshadowed them a moment later, they were prepared, and knew what to do. At my chief's order they sprang at the right instant, seized the guard, 
and were hauled aboard. The next moment the sounding yawl swept aft to the wheel, and was struck and splintered to atoms. Two of the men and the cub Tom were missing, a fact which spread like wildfire over the boat. The passengers came flocking to the forward gangway, ladies and all, anxious-eyed, white-faced, and talked in awed voices of the dreadful thing. And often again I heard them say, "'Poor fellows! Poor boy! Poor boy!' By this time the boat's yawl was manned and away, to search for the missing. Now a faint call was heard, off to the left. The yawl had disappeared in the other direction. Half the people rushed to one side to encourage the swimmer with their shouts. The other half rushed the other way to shriek to the yawl to turn about. By the callings the swimmer was approaching. But some said the sound showed failing strength. The crowd massed themselves against the boiler-deck railings, leaning over and staring into the gloom and every faint and fainter cry wrung from them such words as, "'Ah, oh, poor fellow! Poor fellow! Is there no way to save him?' But still the cries held out, and drew nearer, and presently the voice said pluckily, "'I can make it! Stand by with a rope!' What a rousing cheer they gave him! The chief mate took his hand in the glare of a torch-basket, a coil of rope in his hand, and his men grouped about him. The next moment the swimmer's face appeared in the circle of light, and in another one the owner of it was hauled aboard, limp and drenched, while cheer on cheer went up. It was that devil Tom. The yawl crew searched everywhere, but found no sign of the two men. They probably failed to catch the guard, tumbled back, and were struck by the wheel and killed. Tom had never jumped for the guard at all, but had plunged headfirst into the river and dived under the wheel. It was nothing. I could have done it easy enough, and I said so but everybody went on just the same, making a wonderful to-do over that ass, as if he had done something great. That girl couldn't seem to have enough of that pitiful hero the rest of the trip. But little I cared. I loathed her anyway. The way we came to mistake the sounding-boat's lantern for the buoy's light was this. My chief said that after laying the buoy, he fell away and watched it till it seemed to be secure. Then he took up a position a hundred yards below it, and a little to one side of the steamer's course, headed the sounding-boat upstream, and waited. Having to wait some time, he and the officer got to talking. He looked up, when he judged that the steamer was about on the reef, saw that the buoy was gone, and supposed that the steamer had already run over it. He went on with his talk. He noticed that the steamer was getting very close on him, but that was the correct thing. It was her business to shave him closely, for convenience in taking him aboard. He was expecting her to sheer off, until the last moment. Then it flashed upon him that she was trying to run him down, mistaking his lantern for the buoy-light. So he sang out, "'Stand by to spring for the guard, men!' And the next instant the jump was made. CHAPTER Thirteen, A PILOT'S NEEDS but I am wandering from what I was intending to do, that is, make plainer than perhaps appears in the previous chapters, some of the peculiar requirements of the science of piloting. First of all, there is one faculty which a pilot must incessantly cultivate until he has brought it to absolute perfection. Nothing short of perfection will do. That faculty is memory. He cannot stop with merely thinking a thing is so-and-so. He must know it for this is eminently one of the exact sciences. With what scorn a pilot was looked upon in the old times, if he ever ventured to deal in that feeble phrase, I think, instead of the vigorous one, I know. One cannot easily realize what a tremendous thing it is to know every trivial detail of twelve hundred miles of river, and know it with absolute exactness. If you will take the longest street in New York, and travel up and down it, conning its features patiently until you know every house and window and door and lamp-post and big and little sign by heart, and know them so accurately that you can instantly name the one you are abreast of when you are set down at random in that street in the middle of an inky black night, you will then have a tolerable notion of the amount and the exactness of a pilot's knowledge who carries the Mississippi River in his head. And then, if you will go on until you know every street crossing, the character, size, and position of the crossing stones, and the varying depth of mud in each of those numberless places, you will have some idea of what the pilot must know in order to keep a Mississippi steamer out of trouble. 
Next, if you will take half of the signs in that long street, and change their places once a month, and still manage to know their new positions accurately on dark nights, and keep up with these repeated changes without making any mistakes, you will understand what is required of a pilot's peerless memory of the fickle Mississippi. I think a pilot's memory is about the most wonderful thing in the world. To know the Old and New Testaments by heart, and be able to recite them glibly, forward or backward, or begin at random anywhere in the book and recite both ways, and never trip or make a mistake, is no extravagant mass of knowledge, and no marvelous facility compared to a pilot's massed knowledge of the Mississippi, and his marvelous facility in the handling of it. I make this comparison deliberately, and believe I am not expanding the truth when I do it. Many will think my figure too strong, but pilots will not. And how easily and comfortably the pilot's memory does its work! How placidly effortless is its way! How unconsciously it lays up its vast stores, hour by hour, day by day, and never loses or mislays a single valuable package of them all! Take an instance. Let a leadsman cry, Half twain! Half twain! Half twain! Half twain! Half twain! until it become as monotonous as the ticking of a clock, let conversation be going on all the time, and the pilot be doing his share of the talking, and no longer consciously listening to the leadsman, and in the midst of this endless string of half-twains let a single quarter-twain be interjected, without emphasis, and then the half-twain cry go on again, just as before. Two or three weeks later that pilot can describe with precision the boat's position in the river when that quarter-twain was uttered, and give you such a lot of head-marks, stern-marks, and side-marks to guide you, that you ought to be able to take the boat there, and put her in that same spot again yourself. The cry of quarter-twain did not really take his mind from his talk, but his trained faculties instantly photographed the bearings, noted the change of depth, and laid up the important details for future reference without requiring any assistance from him in the matter. If you were walking and talking with a friend, and another friend at your side kept up a monotonous repetition of the vowel sound A for a couple of blocks, and then in the midst interjected an R, thus A, 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 R, A, 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 etc., and gave the R no emphasis, you would not be able to state, two or three weeks afterward, that the R had been put in, nor be able to tell what objects you were passing at the moment it was done. But you could, if your memory had been patiently and laboriously trained, to do that sort of thing mechanically. Give a man a tolerably fair memory to start with, and piloting will develop it into a very colossus of capability. But only in the matters it is daily drilled in. A time would come when the man's faculties could not help noticing landmarks and soundings, and his memory could not help holding on to them with the grip of a vice. But if you asked that same man at noon what he had had for breakfast, it would be ten chances to one that he could not tell you. Astonishing things can be done with the human memory, if you will devote it faithfully to one particular line of business. At the time that wages soared so high on the Missouri River, my chief, Mr. Bixby, went up there, and learned more than a thousand miles of that stream, with an ease and rapidity that were astonishing. When he had seen each division once in the daytime, and once at night, his education was so nearly complete that he took out a daylight license. A few trips later he took out a full license, and went to piloting day and night, and he ranked A-1, too. Mr. Bixby placed me as a steersman for a while under a pilot whose feats of memory were a constant marvel to me. However, his memory was born in him, I think, not built. For instance, somebody would mention a name. Instantly Mr. Brown would break in, "'Oh, I knew him! Sallow-faced, red-headed fellow, with a little scar on the side of his throat, like a splinter under the flesh. He was only in the southern trade six months. That was thirteen years ago. I made a trip with him.' There was five feet in the upper river then. The Henry Blake grounded at the foot of Tower Island, drawing four and a half. The George Elliot unshipped her rudder on the wreck of the Sunflower. Why, the Sunflower didn't sink till— I know when she sunk! It was three years before that, on the 2nd of December. Asa Hardy was captain of her, and his brother John was first clerk, and it was his first trip in her, too. 
Tom Jones told me these things a week afterward in New Orleans. He was first mate of the Sunflower. Captain Hardy stuck a nail in his foot the 6th of July of the next year, and died of the lockjaw on the 15th. His brother died two years after, 3rd of March. Erisipolis. I never saw either of the Hardys. They were Allegheny River men, but people who knew them told me all these things. And they said Captain Hardy wore yarn socks, winter and summer, just the same, and his first wife's name was Jane Shook. She was from New England, and his second one died in a lunatic asylum. It was in the blood. She was from Lexington, Kentucky. Name was Horton before she was married. And so on, by the hour, the man's tongue would go. He could not forget anything. It was simply impossible. The most trivial details remained as distinct and luminous in his head, after they had lain there for years, as the most memorable events. His was not simply a pilot's memory. His grasp was universal. If he were talking about a trifling letter he had received seven years before, he was pretty sure to deliver you the entire screed from memory. And then, without observing that he was departing from the true line of his talk, he was more than likely to hurl in a long-drawn parenthetical biography of the writer of that letter, and you were lucky indeed if you did not take up that writer's relatives, one by one, and give you their biographies, too. Such a memory as that is a great misfortune. To it all occurrences are of the same size. Its possessor cannot distinguish an interesting circumstance from an uninteresting one. As a talker, he is bound to clog his narrative with tiresome details, and make himself an insufferable bore. Moreover, he cannot stick to his subject. He picks up every little grain of memory he discerns in his way, and so is led aside. Mr. Brown would start out with the honest intention of telling you a vastly funny anecdote about a dog. He would be so full of laugh that he could hardly begin. Then his memory would start with the dog's breed and personal appearance, drift into the history of his owner, of his owner's family, with descriptions of weddings and burials that had occurred in it, together with recitals of congratulatory verses and obituary poetry provoked by the same. Then this memory would recollect that one of these events occurred during the celebrated hard winter of such and such year, and a minute description of that winter would follow along with the names of people who were frozen to death, and statistics showing the high figures which pork and hay went up to. Pork and hay would suggest corn and fodder. Corn and fodder would suggest cows and horses. And cows and horses would suggest the circus and certain celebrated bareback riders. The transition from the circus to the menagerie was easy and natural. From the elephant to equatorial Africa was but a step. Then, of course, the heathen savages would suggest religion, and at the end of three or four hours' tedious jaw the watch would change, and Brown would go out of the pilot-house muttering extracts from sermons he had heard years before about the efficacy of prayer as a means of grace, and the original first mention would be all you had learned about that dog, after all this waiting and hungering. A pilot must have a memory. But there are two higher qualities which he must also have. He must have good and quick judgment and decision, and a cool, calm courage that no peril can shake. Give a man the merest trifle of pluck to start with, and by the time he has become a pilot, he cannot be unmanned by any danger a steamboat can get into. But one cannot quite say the same for judgment. Judgment is a matter of brains, and a man must start with a good stock of that article or he will never succeed as a pilot. The growth of courage in the pilot-house is steady all the time, but it does not reach a high and satisfactory condition until some time after the young pilot has been standing his own watch, alone, and under the staggering weight of all the responsibilities connected with the position. When an apprentice has become pretty thoroughly acquainted with the river, he goes clattering along so fearlessly with his steamboat, night or day, that he presently begins to imagine that it is his courage that animates him. But the first time the pilot steps out and leaves him to his own devices, he finds out it was the other man's. He discovers that the article has been left out of his own cargo altogether. The whole river is bristling with exigencies in a moment. He is not prepared for them. He does not know how to meet them. All his knowledge forsakes him. 
and within fifteen minutes he is as white as a sheet, and scared almost to death. Therefore pilots wisely train these cubs by various strategic tricks to look danger in the face a little more calmly. A favorite way of theirs is to play a friendly swindle upon the candidate. Mr. Bixby served me in this fashion once, and for years afterward I used to blush even in my sleep when I thought of it. I had become a good steersman, so good indeed that I had all the work to do on our watch, night and day. Mr. Bixby seldom made a suggestion to me. All he ever did was to take the wheel on particularly bad nights or in particularly bad crossings, land the boat when she needed to be landed, play gentleman of leisure nine-tenths of the watch, and collect the wages. The lower river was about bank full, and if anybody had questioned my ability to run any crossing between Cairo and New Orleans without help or instruction, I should have felt irreparably hurt. The idea of being afraid of any crossing in the lot, in the daytime, was a thing too preposterous for contemplation. Well, one matchless summer day I was bowling down the bend above Island 66, brimful of self-conceit and carrying my nose as high as a giraffe's, when Mr. Bixby said, "'I'm going below a while. I suppose you know the next crossing?' This was almost an affront. It was about the plainest and simplest crossing in the whole river. One couldn't come to any harm, whether he ran it right or not. And as for depth, there never had been any bottom there. I knew all this perfectly well. "'Know how to run it? Why, I can run it with my eyes shut!' "'How much water is there in it?' "'Well, that is an odd question. I couldn't get bottom there with a church steeple.' "'You think so, do you?' The very tone of the question shook my confidence. That was what Mr. Bixby was expecting. He left without saying anything more. I began to imagine all sorts of things. Mr. Bixby, unknown to me, of course, sent somebody down to the forecastle with some mysterious instructions to the leadsman. Another messenger was sent to whisper among the officers and then Mr. Bixby went into hiding behind a smokestack, where he could observe results. Presently the captain stepped out on the hurricane deck. Next the chief mate appeared, then a clerk. Every moment or two a straggler was added to my audience, and before I got to the head of the island I had fifteen or twenty people assembled down there under my nose. I began to wonder what the trouble was. As I started across the captain glanced aloft at me and said, with a sham uneasiness in his voice. "'Where is Mr. Bixby?' "'Gone below, sir.' But that did the business for me. My imagination began to construct dangers out of nothing, and they multiplied faster than I could keep the run of them. All at once I imagined I saw shoal water ahead. The wave of coward agony that surged through me then came near dislocating every joint in me. All my confidence in that crossing vanished. I seized the bell-rope, dropped it, ashamed, seized it again, dropped it once more, clutched it tremblingly once again, and pulled it so feebly that I could hardly hear the stroke myself. Captain and mate sang out instantly, and both together, "'Starboard lead there, and quick about it!' This was another shock. I began to climb the wheel like a squirrel, but I would hardly get the boat started to port before I would see new dangers on that side, and away I would spin to the other only to find perils accumulating to starboard, and be crazy to get to port again. Then came the leadsman's sepulchre cry, "'Deep four! Deep four in a bottomless crossing! The terror of it took my breath away! Mark three! Mark three! Quarterless three! Half twain!' This was frightful. I eased the bell-ropes and stopped the engines. "'Quarter twain!' Quarter twain! Mark twain! I was helpless. I did not know what in the world to do. I was quaking from head to foot, and I could have hung my hat on my eyes they stuck out so far. Quarter less twain! Nine and a half! We were drawing nine! My hands were in a nerveless flutter. I could not ring a bell intelligibly with them. I flew to the speaking tube and shouted to the engineer. Oh, Ben, if you love me, back her! Quick, Ben! Oh, back the immortal soul out of her!" I heard the door close gently. I looked around, and there stood Mr. Bixby, smiling a bland, sweet smile. Then the audience on the hurricane deck sent up a thunder-gust of humiliating laughter. I saw it all now, and I felt meaner than the meanest man in human history. I laid in the lead, 
set the boat in her marks, came ahead on the engines, and said, "'It was a fine trick to play on an orphan, wasn't it? I suppose I'll never hear the last of how I was ass enough to heave the lead at the head of sixty-six. Well, no, you won't, maybe. In fact, I hope you won't, for I want you to learn something by that experience. Didn't you know there was no bottom in that crossing?' "'Yes, sir, I did.' "'Very well, then. You shouldn't have allowed me or anybody else to shake your confidence in that knowledge. Try to remember that. And another thing, when you get into a dangerous place, don't turn coward. That isn't going to help matters any." It was a good enough lesson, but pretty hardly learned. Yet about the hardest part of it was that for months I so often had to hear a phrase which I had conceived a particular distaste for. It was, "'Oh, Ben, if you love me, back her!' Chapter 14 Rank and Dignity of Piloting In my preceding chapters I have tried, by going into the minutiae of the science of piloting, to carry the reader step by step to a comprehension of what the science consists of, and at the same time I have tried to show him that it is a very curious and wonderful science, too, and very worthy of his attention. If I have seemed to love my subject, it is no surprising thing, for I have loved the profession far better than any I have followed since, and I took a measureless pride in it. The reason is plain. A pilot in those days was the only unfettered and entirely independent human being that lived in the earth. Kings are but the hampered servants of Parliament and people. Parliaments sit in chains forged by their constituency. The editor of a newspaper cannot be independent, but must work with one hand tied behind him by party and patrons, and be content to utter only half or two-thirds of his mind. No clergyman is a free man, and may speak the whole truth, regardless of his parish's opinions. Writers of all kinds are manacled servants of the public. We write frankly and fearlessly, but then we modify before we print. In truth, every man and woman and child has a master, and worries and frets in servitude. But in the day I write of, the Mississippi pilot had none. The captain could stand upon the hurricane deck, in the pomp of a very brief authority, and give him five or six orders, while the vessel backed into the stream, and then that skipper's reign was over. The moment that the boat was under way in the river, she was under the sole and unquestioned control of the pilot. He could do with her exactly as he pleased, run her when and whither he chose, and tie her up to the bank whenever his judgment said that that course was best. His movements were entirely free. He consulted no one, he received commands from nobody, he promptly resented even the merest suggestions. Indeed, the law of the United States forbade him to listen to commands or suggestions, rightly considering that the pilot necessarily knew better how to handle the boat than anybody could tell him. So here was the novelty of a king without a keeper, an absolute monarch who was absolute in sober truth, and not by a fiction of words. I have seen a boy of eighteen taking a great steamer serenely into what seemed almost certain destruction, and the aged captain standing mutely by, filled with apprehension, but powerless to interfere. His interference, in that particular instance, might have been an excellent thing, but to permit it would have been to establish a most pernicious precedent. It will easily be guessed, considering the pilot's boundless authority, that he was a great personage in the old steamboating days. He was treated with marked courtesy by the captain, and with marked deference by all the officers and servants. And this deferential spirit was quickly communicated to the passengers, too. I think pilots were about the only people I ever knew who failed to show, in some degree, embarrassment in the presence of travelling foreign princes. But then, people in one's own grade of life are not usually embarrassing objects. By long habit, pilots came to put all their wishes in the form of commands. It gravels me to this day to put my will in the weak shape of a request, instead of launching it in the crisp language of an order. In those old days, to load a steamboat at St. Louis, take her to New Orleans, and back, and discharge cargo, consumed about twenty-five days on an average. 
Seven or eight of these days the boat spent at the wharves of St. Louis and New Orleans, and every soul on board was hard at work, except the two pilots. They did nothing but play gentlemen uptown, and receive the same wages for it as if they had been on duty. The moment the boat touched the wharf at either city, they were ashore, and they were not likely to be seen again till the last bell was ringing, and everything in readiness for another voyage. When a captain got hold of a pilot of particularly high reputation, he took pains to keep him. When wages were four hundred dollars a month on the upper Mississippi, I have known a captain to keep such a pilot in idleness under full pay three months at a time, while the river was frozen up. And one must remember that in those cheap times four hundred dollars was a salary of almost inconceivable splendor. Few men on shore got such pay as that, and when they did, they were mightily looked up to. When pilots from either end of the river wandered into our small Missouri village, they were sought by the best and the fairest, and treated with exalted respect. Lying in port under wages was a thing which many pilots greatly enjoyed and appreciated, especially if they belonged in the Missouri River in the heyday of that trade, Kansas times, and got nine hundred dollars a trip, which was equivalent to about eighteen hundred dollars a month. Here is a conversation of that day. A chap out of the Illinois River, with a little stern-wheel tub, accosts a couple of ornate and gilded Missouri river pilots. "'Gentlemen, I've got a pretty good trip for the up-country, and shall want you about a month. How much will it be?' Eighteen hundred dollars apiece.' "'Heavens and earth! You take my boat, let me have your wages, and I'll divide.' I will remark, in passing, that Mississippi steamboat men were important in landsmen's eyes, and in their own, too, in a degree, according to the dignity of the boat they were on. For instance, it was a proud thing to be of the crew of such stately craft as the Alec Scott or the Grand Turk. Negro firemen, deck-hands, and barbers belonging to those boats were distinguished personages in their grade of life, and they were well aware of that fact, too. A stalwart darky once gave offence at a negro ball in New Orleans by putting on a good many airs. Finally one of the managers bustled up to him and said, "'Who is you, anyway? Who is you? That's what I want to know.' The offender was not disconcerted in the least, but swelled himself up and threw that into his voice which showed that he knew he was not putting on all those airs on a stinted capital. "'Who is I? Who is I?' i let you know mighty quick who I is. I want you niggers to understand that I fires de middle dough, footnote, door, on to Alex Scott. That was sufficient. The barber of the Grand Turk was a spruce young negro, who aired his importance with balmy complacency, and was greatly courted by the circle in which he moved. The young colored population of New Orleans were much given to flirting at twilight on the banquettes of the back streets. Somebody saw and heard something like the following one evening in one of those localities. A middle-aged negro woman projected her head through a broken pane, and shouted, very willing that the neighbors should hear and envy, "'You, Mary Ann, come in de house dis minute! Standin' out there foolin' long with that low trash, and, and here's the barber off, and the, the Grand Turk wants to converse with you!' My reference, a moment ago, to the fact that a pilot's peculiar official position placed him out of reach of criticism or command, brings Stephen W. naturally to my mind. He was a gifted pilot, a good fellow, a tireless talker, and had both wit and humor in him. He had a most irreverent independence, too, and was deliciously easy-going and comfortable in the presence of age, official dignity, and even the most august wealth. He always had work. He never saved a penny. He was a most persuasive borrower. He was in debt to every pilot on the river, and to the majority of the captains. He could throw a sort of splendor around a bit of harem-scarum, devil-may-care piloting that made it almost fascinating. But not to everybody. He made a trip with good old Captain Y once, and was relieved from duty when the boat got to New Orleans. Somebody expressed surprise at the discharge. Captain Y shuddered at the mere mention of Stephen. Then his poor, thin old voice piped out something like this. "'Why, bless me! 
I wouldn't have such a wild creature on my boat for the world, not for the whole world. He swears, he sings, he whistles, he yells. I never saw such an injun to yell. All times of the night, it never made any difference to him. He would just yell that way, not for anything in particular, but merely on account of a kind of devilish comfort he got out of it. I never could get into a sound sleep, but he would fetch me out of bed, all in a cold sweat, with one of those dreadful war-whoops. A queer being, very queer being. No respect for anything or anybody. Sometimes he called me Johnny, and he kept a fiddle and a cat. He played execrably. This seemed to distress the cat, and so the cat would howl. Nobody could sleep where that man and his family was. And reckless! There never was anything like it. Now you may believe it or not, but as sure as I am sitting here, he brought my boat a tilting down through those awful snaps she caught, under a rattling's head of steam, and the wind a blowing like the very nation at that. My officers will tell you so. They saw it. And, sir, while he was a tearin' right down through those snags, and I a shakin' in my shoes and praying, I wish I may never speak again if he didn't pucker up his mouth and go to whistling. Yes, sir, whistling, Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? I'm doing it as calmly as if we were attending a funeral and weren't related to the corpse. And when I remonstrated with him about it, why, he, he smiled down on me as if I was his child, and told me to run in the house and try to be good, and not be meddling with my superiors. Once a pretty mean captain caught Stephen in New Orleans out of work and as usual out of money. He laid steady siege to Stephen, who was in the very close place, and finally persuaded him to hire with him at one hundred and twenty-five dollars a month, just half wages the captain agreeing not to divulge the secret, and so bring down the contempt of all the guild upon the poor fellow. But the boat was not more than a day out of New Orleans before Stephen discovered that the captain was boasting of his exploit, and that all the officers had been told. Stephen winced, but said nothing. About the middle of the afternoon the captain stepped out on the hurricane deck, cast his eye around, and looked a good deal surprised. He glanced inquiringly aloft at Stephen. But Stephen was whistling placidly and attending to business. The captain stood around a while in evident discomfort, and once or twice seemed about to make a suggestion. But the etiquette of the river taught him to avoid that sort of rashness, and so he managed to hold his peace. He chafed and puzzled a few minutes longer, then retired to his apartments. But soon he was out again, and apparently more perplexed than ever. Presently he ventured to remark, with deference, pretty good stage of the river now, ain't it, sir?" Well, I should say so. Bankful is a pretty liberal stage. Seems to be a good deal of current here. Good deal don't describe it. It's worse than a mill-race. Isn't it uh, easier in towards shore than it is out here in the middle? Yes, I reckon it is. But a body can't be too careful with a steamboat. It's pretty safe out here. Can't strike any bottom here. You can depend on that." The captain departed, looking rueful enough. At this rate he would probably die of old age before his boat got to St. Louis. Next day he appeared on deck, and again found Stephen faithfully standing up the middle of the river, fighting the whole vast force of the Mississippi, and whistling the same placid tune. This thing was becoming serious. In by the shore was a slower boat clipping along in the easy water and gaining steadily. She began to make for an island chute. Stephen stuck to the middle of the river. Speech was wrung from the captain. He said, "'Mr. W., don't that chute cut off a good deal of distance?' "'Well, I think it does, but I don't know.' "'Don't know? Well, isn't there water enough in it now to go through?' "'I expect there is, but I am not certain.' Upon my word, this is odd. Why, those pilots on that boat yonder are going to try it. Do you mean to say that you don't know as much as they do? They? Why, they are two hundred and fifty dollar pilots. But don't you be uneasy. I know as much as any man can afford to know for a hundred and twenty-five. The captain surrendered. Five minutes later Stephen was bowling through the chute and showing the rival boat a two hundred and fifty dollar pair of heels.
Chapter Fifteen: The Pilot's Monopoly. One day on board the Alex Scott, my chief, Mr. Bixby, was crawling carefully through a close place at Cat Island, both leads going, and everybody holding his breath. The captain, a nervous, apprehensive man, kept still as long as he could, but finally broke down and shouted from the hurricane deck. For gracious sake, give her steam, Mr. Bixby, give her steam! She'll never raise the reef on this headway! For all the effect that was produced upon Mr. Bixby, one would have supposed that no remark had been made. But five minutes later, when the danger was past and the leads laid in, he burst instantly into a consuming fury and gave the captain the most admirable cursing I ever listened to. No bloodshed ensued. But that was because the captain's cause was weak, for ordinarily he was not a man to take correction quietly. Having now set forth in detail the nature of the science of piloting, and likewise described the rank which the pilot held among the fraternity of steamboatmen, this seems a fitting place to say a few words about an organization which the pilots once formed for the protection of their guild. It was curious and noteworthy in this that it was perhaps the compactest, the completest, and the strongest commercial organization ever formed among men. For a long time wages had been two hundred and fifty dollars a month, but curiously enough, as steamboats multiplied and business increased, the wages began to fall little by little. It was easy to discover the reason of this. Too many pilots were being made. It was nice to have a cub, a steersman, to do all the hard work for a couple of years, gratis, while his master sat on a high bench and smoked. All pilots and captains had sons or nephews who wanted to be pilots. By and by it came to pass that nearly every pilot on the river had a steersman. When a steersman had made an amount of progress that was satisfactory to any two pilots in the trade, they could get a pilot's license for him by signing an application directed to the United States inspector. Nothing further was needed. Usually no questions were asked, no proofs of capacity required. Very well, this growing swarm of new pilots presently began to undermine the wages in order to get berths. Too late, apparently, the knights of the tiller perceived their mistake. Plainly, something had to be done, and quickly. But what was to be the needful thing? a close organization. Nothing else would answer. To compass this seemed an impossibility. So it was talked, and talked, and then dropped. It was too likely to ruin whoever ventured to move in the matter. But at last about a dozen of the boldest, and some of them the best, pilots on the river launched themselves into the enterprise, and took all the chances. They got a special charter from the legislature, with large powers, under the name of the Pilots' Benevolent Association, elected their officers, completed their organization, contributed capital, put association wages up to two hundred and fifty dollars at once, and then retired to their homes, for they were promptly discharged from employment. But there were two or three unnoticed trifles in their by-laws, which had the seeds of propagation in them. For instance, all idle members of the association in good standing were entitled to a pension of twenty-five dollars per month. This began to bring in one straggler after another from the ranks of the new-fledged pilots, in the dull summer season. Better have twenty-five dollars than starve. The initiation fee was only twelve dollars, and no dues required from the unemployed. Also, the widows of deceased members in good standing could draw twenty-five dollars per month, and a certain sum for each of their children. Also, the said deceased would be buried at the association's expense. These things resurrected all the superannuated and forgotten pilots in the Mississippi Valley. They came from farms, they came from interior villages, they came from everywhere. They came on crutches, on drays, in ambulances, any way, so they got there. They paid in their twelve dollars, and straightway began to draw out twenty-five dollars a month, and calculate their burial bills. By and by, all the useless, helpless pilots, and a dozen first-class ones, were in the association, and nine-tenths of the best pilots out of it, and laughing at it. It was the laughing-stock of the whole river. 
Everybody joked about the by-law requiring members to pay ten percent of their wages every month into the treasury for the support of the association, whereas all the members were outcast and tabooed, and no one would employ them. Everybody was derisively grateful to the association for taking all the worthless pilots out of the way and leaving the whole field to the excellent and the deserving. And everybody was not only jocularly grateful for that, but for a result which naturally followed, namely, the gradual advance of wages as the busy season approached. Wages had gone up from the low figure of one hundred dollars a month to one hundred and twenty-five, and in some cases to one hundred and fifty and it was great fun to enlarge upon the fact that this charming thing had been accomplished by a body of men not one of whom received a particle of benefit from it. Some of the jokers used to call at the association rooms and have a good time chafing the members and offering them the charity of taking them as steersmen for a trip, so that they could see what the forgotten river looked like. However, the association was content, or at least it gave no sign to the contrary. Now and then it captured a pilot who was out of luck, and added him to its list. And these later additions were very valuable, for they were good pilots. The incompetent ones had all been absorbed before. As business freshened, wages climbed gradually up to two hundred and fifty dollars, the association figure, and became firmly fixed there, and still without benefiting a member of that body, for no member was hired. The hilarity at the association's expense burst all bounds now. There was no end to the fun which that poor martyr had to put up with. However, it is a long lane that has no turning. Winter approached, business doubled and trebled, and an avalanche of Missouri, Illinois, and upper Mississippi river-boats came pouring down to take a chance in the New Orleans trade. All of a sudden pilots were in great demand, and were correspondingly scarce. The time for revenge was come. It was a bitter pill to have to accept association pilots at last, yet captains and owners agreed that there was no other way, but none of these outcasts offered. So there was a still bitterer pill to be swallowed. They must be sought out and asked for their services. Captain Blank was the first man who found it necessary to take the dose, and he had been the loudest derider of the organization. He hunted up one of the best of the association pilots, and said, "'Well, you boys have rather got the best of us for a little while, so I'll give in with as good a grace as I can. I've come to hire you. Get your trunk aboard right away. I want to leave at twelve o'clock.' "'I don't know about that. Uh, who is your other pilot?' "'I've got I.S. Why?' "'I can't go with him. He don't belong to the association.' "'What?' "'It's so.' you mean to tell me that you won't turn a wheel with one of the very best and oldest pilots on the river, because he don't belong to your association? Yes, I do. Well, if this isn't putting on airs, I supposed I was doing you a benevolence, but I begin to think that I am the party that wants a favor done. Are you acting under a law of the concern? Yes. Show it to me. So they stepped into the association rooms, and the secretary soon satisfied the captain, who said, "'Well, what am I to do? I have hired Mr. S. for the entire season.' "'I will provide for you,' said the secretary. "'I will detail a pilot to go with you, and he shall be on board at twelve o'clock.' "'But if I discharge S., he will come on me for the whole season's wages.' "'Of course, that is a matter between you and Mr. S., Captain.' We cannot meddle in your private affairs." The captain stormed, but to no purpose. In the end he had to discharge S., pay him about a thousand dollars, and take an association pilot in his place. The laugh was beginning to turn the other way now. Every day, thenceforward, a new victim fell. Every day some outraged captain discharged a non-association pet with tears and profanity, and installed a hated association man in his berth. In a very little while idle non-associationists began to be pretty plenty, brisk as business was, and much as their services were desired. The laugh was shifting to the other side of their mouths most palpably. These victims, together with the captains and owners, presently ceased to laugh altogether, and began to rage about the revenge they would take when the passing business spurt was over. 
Soon all the laughers that were left were the owners and the crews of boats that had two non-association pilots. But their triumph was not very long-lived, for this reason. It was a rigid rule of the association that its members should never, under any circumstances whatever, give information about the channel to any outsider. By this time about half the boats had none but association pilots, and the other half had none but outsiders. At the first glance one would suppose that, when it came to forbidding information about the river, these two parties could play equally at that game, but this was not so. At every good-sized town, from one end of the river to the other, there was a wharf-boat to land at, instead of a wharf or a pier. Freight was stored in it for transportation. Waiting passengers slept in its cabins. Upon each of these wharf-boats the association's officers placed a strong-box, fastened with a peculiar lock, which was used in no other service but one, the United States Mail Service. It was the letter-bag lock, a sacred governmental thing. By dint of much beseeching, the government had been persuaded to allow the association to use this lock. Every association man carried a key which would open these boxes. That key, or rather a peculiar way of holding it in the hand when its owner was asked for river information by a stranger, for the success of the St. Louis and New Orleans Association had now bred tolerably thriving branches in a dozen neighboring steamboat trades was the association man's sign and diploma of membership, and if the stranger did not respond by producing a similar key and holding it in a certain manner duly prescribed, his question was politely ignored. From the association secretary each member received a package of more or less gorgeous blanks, printed like a billhead, on handsome paper, properly ruled in columns, a billhead worded something like this. Steamer Great Republic, John Smith, Master. Pilots, John Jones and Thomas Brown. Crossings, soundings, marks, remarks. These blanks were filled up day by day as the voyage progressed, and deposited in the several wharf-boat boxes. For instance, as soon as the first crossing out from St. Louis was completed, the items would be entered upon the blank under the appropriate headings thus. St. Louis, nine and a half feet. Stern on courthouse, head on dead cottonwood above woodyard, until you raise the first reef, then pull up square. Then under head of remarks, go just outside the wrecks. This is important. New snag just where you straighten down. Go above it. The pilot who deposited that blank in the Cairo box, after adding to it the details of every crossing all the way down from St. Louis, took out and read half a dozen fresh reports from upward-bound steamers. Concerning the river between Cairo and Memphis, posted himself thoroughly, returned them to the box, and went back aboard his boat again, so armed against accident that he could not possibly get his boat into trouble without bringing the most ingenious carelessness to his aid. Imagine the benefits of so admirable a system in a piece of river twelve or thirteen hundred miles long, whose channel was shifting every day. The pilot, who had formerly been obliged to put up with seeing a shoal place once or possibly twice a month, had a hundred sharp eyes to watch it for him now, and bushels of intelligent brains to tell him how to run it. His information about it was seldom twenty-four hours old. If the reports in the last box chanced to leave any misgivings on his mind concerning a treacherous crossing, he had his remedy. He blew his steam-whistle in a peculiar way as soon as he saw a boat approaching. The signal was answered in a peculiar way, if that boat's pilots were association men. And then the two steamers ranged alongside, and all uncertainties were swept away by fresh information furnished to the inquirer by word of mouth and in minute detail. The first thing a pilot did when he reached New Orleans or St. Louis was to take his final and elaborate report to the association parlors and hang it up there, after which he was free to visit his family. In these parlors a crowd was always gathered together, discussing changes in the channel, and the moment there was a fresh arrival, everybody stopped talking till this witness had told the newest news and settled the latest uncertainty. Other craftsmen can sink the shop sometimes, and interest themselves in other matters. Not so with a pilot. He must devote himself wholly to his profession, and talk of nothing else. For it would be small gain to be perfect one day and imperfect the next. 
He has no time or words to waste if he would keep posted. But the outsiders had a hard time of it. No particular place to meet and exchange information. No wharf boat reports. None but chance and unsatisfactory ways of getting news. The consequence was that a man sometimes had to run five hundred miles of river on information that was a week or ten days old. At a fair stage of the river that might have answered, but when the dead low water came, it was destructive. Now came another perfectly logical result. The outsiders began to ground steamboats, sink them, and get into all sorts of trouble, whereas accidents seemed to keep entirely away from the association men. Wherefore, even the owners and captains of boats furnished exclusively with outsiders, and previously considered to be wholly independent of the association and free to comfort themselves with brag and laughter, began to feel pretty uncomfortable. Still, they made a show of keeping up the brag until one black day when every captain of the lot was formally ordered to immediately discharge his outsiders and take association pilots in their stead. And who was it that had the dashing presumption to do that? Alas, it came from a power behind the throne that was greater than the throne itself. It was the underwriters. It was no time to swap knives. Every outsider had to take his trunk ashore at once. Of course, it was supposed that there was collusion between the association and the underwriters, but this was not so. The latter had come to comprehend the excellence of the report system of the association and the safety it secured, and so they had made their decision among themselves and upon plain business principles. There was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in the camp of the outsiders now, but no matter, there was just but one course for them to pursue, and they pursued it. They came forward in couples and groups, and proffered their twelve dollars and asked for membership. They were surprised to learn that several new bylaws had been long ago added. For instance, the initiation fee had been raised to fifty dollars, that sum must be tendered, and also ten per cent of the wages which the applicant had received each and every month since the founding of the association. In many cases, this amounted to three or four hundred dollars. Still, the association would not entertain the application until the money was present. Even then, a single adverse vote killed the application. Every member had to vote yes or no in person and before witnesses. So it took weeks to decide a candidacy, because many pilots were so long absent on voyages. However, the repentant sinners scraped their savings together, and one by one, by our tedious voting process, they were added to the fold. A time came at last when only about ten remained outside. They said they would starve before they would apply. They remained idle a long time, because, of course, nobody could venture to employ them. By and by, the association published the fact that upon a certain date the wages would be raised to five hundred dollars per month. All the branch associations had grown strong now, and the Red River one had advanced wages to seven hundred dollars a month. Reluctantly, the ten outsiders yielded, in view of these things, and made application. There was another new by law by this time which required them to pay dues not only on all the wages they had received since the association was born, but also on what they would have received if they had continued at work up to the time of their application, instead of going off to pout in idleness.、It、turned out to be a difficult matter to elect them, but it was accomplished at last. The most virulent sinner of this batch had stayed out and allowed dues to accumulate against him so long that he had to send in six hundred and twenty five dollars with his application. The association had a good bank account now and was very strong. There was no longer an outsider. A by law was added forbidding the reception of any more cubs or apprentices for five years, after which time a limited number would be taken, not by individuals. But by the association, upon these terms, the applicant must not be less than eighteen years old and of respectable family and good character. He must pass an examination as to education, pay a thousand dollars in advance for the privilege of becoming an apprentice, and must remain under the commands of the association until a great part of the membership, more than half, I think, should be willing to sign his application for a pilot's license. All previously articled apprentices were now taken away from their masters and adopted by the association. The president and secretary detailed them for service on one boat or another as they chose, 
and change them from boat to boat according to certain rules. If a pilot could show that he was in infirm health and needed assistance, one of the cubs would be ordered to go with him. The widow and orphan list grew, but so did the association's financial resources. The association attended its own funerals in state and paid for them. When occasion demanded, it sent members down the river upon searches for the bodies of brethren lost by steamboat accidents. A search of this kind sometimes cost a thousand dollars. The association procured a charter and went into the insurance business also. It not only insured the lives of its members, but took risks on steamboats. The organization seemed indestructible. It was the tightest monopoly in the world. By the United States law, no man could become a pilot unless two duly licensed pilots signed his application. And now there was nobody outside of the association competent to sign. Consequently, the making of pilots was at an end. Every year some would die, and others would become incapacitated by age and infirmity. There would be no new ones to take their places. In time, the association could put wages up to any figure it chose. And as long as it should be wise enough not to carry the thing too far and provoke the national government into amending the licensing system, steamboat owners would have to submit, since there would be no help for it. The owners and captains were the only obstruction that lay between the association and absolute power, and at last this one was removed. Incredible as it may seem, the owners and captains deliberately did it themselves. When the Pilots Association announced months beforehand that on the first day of September 1861 wages would be advanced to five hundred dollars per month, the owners and captains instantly put freights up a few cents, and explained to the farmers along the river the necessity of it by calling their attention to the burdensome rate of wages about to be established. It was a rather slender argument, but the farmers did not seem to detect it. It looked reasonable to them that to add five cents freight on a bushel of corn was justifiable under the circumstances, overlooking the fact that this advance on a cargo of forty thousand sacks was a good deal more than necessary to cover the new wages. So straightway the captains and owners got up an association of their own, and proposed to put captains' wages up to five hundred dollars, too, and move for another advance in freights. It was a novel idea, but of course an effect which had been produced once could be produced again. The new association decreed, for this was before all the outsiders had been taken into the pilots' association, that if any captain employed a non-association pilot, he should be forced to discharge him, and also pay a fine of five hundred dollars. Several of these heavy fines were paid, before the captain's organization grew strong enough to exercise full authority over its membership, but that all ceased presently. The captains tried to get the pilots to decree that no member of their corporation should serve under a non-association captain, but this proposition was declined. The pilots saw that they would be backed up by the captains and the underwriters anyhow, and so they wisely refrained from entering into entangling alliances. As I have remarked, the Pilots' Association was now the compactest monopoly in the world, perhaps, and seemed simply indestructible. And yet the days of its glory were numbered. First, the new railroad stretching up through Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky to northern railway centers began to divert the passenger travel from the steamers. Next, the war came, and almost entirely annihilated the steamboating industry during several years, leaving most of the pilots idle, and the cost of living advancing all the time. Then the treasurer of the St. Louis Association put his hand into the till, and walked off with every dollar of the ample fund. And finally, the railroads intruding everywhere, there was little for steamers to do, when the war was over, but carry freights. So straightway some genius from the Atlantic coast introduced the plan of towing a dozen steamer cargoes down to New Orleans at the tail of a vulgar little tugboat, and, behold, in the twinkling of an eye, as it were, the association and the noble science of piloting were things of the dead and pathetic past. CHAPTER Sixteen, RACING DAYS it was always the custom for the boats to leave New Orleans between four and five o'clock in the afternoon. From three o'clock onward they would be burning rosin and pitch-pine, the sign of preparation, 
and so one had the picturesque spectacle of a rank some two or three miles long of tall ascending columns of coal-black smoke a colonnade which supported a sable roof of the same smoke blended together and spreading abroad over the city every outboard bound boat had its flag flying at the jackstaff and sometimes a duplicate on the verge staff astern two or three miles of mates were commanding and swearing with more than usual emphasis countless processions of freight barrels and boxes were spinning athwart the levee and flying aboard the stage planks belated passengers were dodging and skipping among these frantic things hoping to reach the forecastle companionway alive but having their doubts about it women with reticules and bandboxes were trying to keep up with husbands freighted with carpet sacks and crying babies and making a failure of it by losing their heads in the whirl and roar and general distraction drays and baggage vans were clattering hither and thither in a wild hurry every now and then getting blocked and jammed together and then during ten seconds one could not see them for the profanity except vaguely and dimly every windlass connected with every forehatch from one end of that long array of steamboats to the other was keeping up a deafening whiz and whirr lowering freight into the hold and the half-naked crews of perspiring negroes that worked them were roaring such songs as de la sac de la sac inspired to unimaginable exultation by the chaos of turmoil and racket that was driving everybody else mad by this time the hurricane and boiler decks of the steamers would be packed and black with passengers the last bells would begin to clang all down the line and then the powwow seemed to double in a moment or two the final warning came a simultaneous din of chinese gongs with a cry all that ain't goin please to get ashore and behold the powwow quadrupled people came swarming ashore overturning excited stragglers that were trying to swarm aboard one more moment later a long array of stage planks was being hauled in each with its customary latest passenger clinging to the end of it with teeth nails and everything else and the customary latest procrastinator making a wild spring shoreward over his head now a number of the boats slide backward into the stream leaving wide gaps in the serried rank of steamers citizens crowd the decks of boats that are not to go in order to see the sight steamer after steamer straightens herself up gathers all her strength and presently comes swinging by under a tremendous head of steam with flag flying black smoke rolling and her entire crew of firemen and deckhands usually swarthy negroes massed together on the forecastle the best voice in the lot towering from the myths being mounted on the capstan waving his hat or a flag and all roaring a mighty chorus while the parting cannons boom and the multitudinous spectators swing their hats and huzzah steamer after steamer falls into line and the stately procession goes winging its flight up the river in the old times whenever two fast boats started out on a race with a big crowd of people looking on it was inspiring to hear the crews sing especially if the time were nightfall and the forecastle lit up with the red glare of the torch baskets racing was royal fun the public always had an idea that racing was dangerous whereas the opposite was the case that is after the laws were passed which restricted each boat to just so many pounds of steam to the square inch no engineer was ever sleepy or careless when his heart was in a race he was constantly on the alert trying gauge-cocks and watching things the dangerous place was on slow plodding boats where the engineers drowsed around and allowed chips to get into the doctor and shut off the water supply from the boilers in the flush times of steamboating a race between two notoriously fleet steamers was an event of vast importance the date was set for it several weeks in advance and from that time forward the whole mississippi valley was in a state of consuming excitement politics and the weather were dropped and people talked only of the coming race as the time approached the two steamers stripped and got ready every encumbrance that added weight or exposed a resisting surface to wind or water was removed if the boat could possibly do without it the spars and sometimes even their supporting derricks were sent ashore 
and no means left to set the boat afloat in case she got aground. When the Eclipse and the A. L. Shotwell ran their great race many years ago, it was said that pains were taken to scrape the gilding off the fanciful device which hung between the Eclipse's chimneys, and that for that one trip the captain left off his kid gloves and had his head shaved. But I always doubted these things. If the boat was known to make her best speed when drawing five and a half feet forward and five feet aft, she was carefully loaded to that exact figure. She wouldn't enter a dose of homeopathic pills on her manifest after that. Hardly any passengers were taken, because they not only add weight, but they never will trim boat. They always run to the side when there is anything to see, whereas a conscientious and experienced steamboatman would stick to the center of the boat and part his hair in the middle with a spirit level. No way freights and no way passengers were allowed, for the racers would stop only at the largest towns, and then it would be only touch-and-go. Coal-flats and wood-flats were contracted for beforehand, and these were kept ready to hitch on to the flying steamers at a moment's warning. Double crews were carried, so that all work could be quickly done. The chosen date being come, and all things in readiness, the two great steamers back into the stream, there jockeying a moment, and apparently watching each other's slightest movement, like sentient creatures. Flags drooping, the pent steam shrieking through safety valves, the black smoke rolling and tumbling from the chimneys and darkening all the air. People, people everywhere. The shores, the housetops, the steamboats, the ships are packed with them. And you know that the borders of the broad Mississippi are going to be fringed with humanity thence northward twelve hundred miles to welcome these racers. Presently tall columns of steam burst forth from the scape pipes of both steamers, two guns boom a good-bye, two red-shirted heroes mounted on capstans wave their small flags above the massed crews on the forecastles, two plaintive solos linger on the air a few waiting seconds, two mighty choruses burst forth, and here they come. Brass bands bray, hail Columbia, huzzah after huzzah thunders from the shores, and the stately creatures go whistling by like the wind. Those boats will never halt a moment between New Orleans and St. Louis, except for a second or two at large towns, or to hitch thirty-cord wood-boats alongside. You should be on board when they take a couple of those wood-boats in tow, and turn a swarm of men into each. By the time you have wiped your glasses and put them on, you will be wondering what has become of that wood. Two nicely matched steamers will stay in sight of each other day after day. They might even stay side by side, but for the fact that pilots are not all alike, and the smartest pilots will win the race. If one of the boats has a lightning pilot, whose partner is a trifle his inferior, you can tell which one is on watch by noting whether that boat has gained ground or lost some during each four-hour stretch. The shrewdest pilot can delay a boat if he has not a fine genius for steering. Steering is a very high art. One must not keep a rudder dragging across a boat's stern if he wants to get up the river fast. There is a great difference in boats, of course. For a long time I was on a boat that was so slow we used to forget what year it was we left port in. But of course this was at rare intervals. Ferry boats used to lose valuable trips, because their passengers grew old and died waiting for us to get by. This was at still rarer intervals. I had the documents for these occurrences, but through carelessness uh, they have been mislaid. This boat, the John J. Rowe, was so slow that when she finally sunk in Madrid Bend it was five years before the owners heard of it. That was always a confusing fact to me, but it is according to the record, anyway. She was dismally slow. Still we often had pretty exciting times racing with islands, and rafts, and such things. One trip, however, we did rather well. We went to St. Louis in sixteen days. But even at this rattling gate I think we changed watches three times in Fort Adams Reach, which is five miles long. A reach is a piece of straight river, and of course the current drives through such a place in a pretty lively way. That trip we went to Grand Gulf from New Orleans, in four days, three hundred and forty miles. 
The Eclipse and Shotwell did it in one. We were nine days out in the shoot of sixty-three, seven hundred miles. The Eclipse and Shotwell went there in two days. Something over a generation ago a boat called the J. M. White went from New Orleans to Cairo in three days, six hours, and forty-four minutes. In 1853 the Eclipse made the same trip in three days, three hours, and twenty minutes. Footnote. Time disputed. Some authorities add one hour and sixteen minutes to this. In 1870 the R. E. Lee did it in three days and one hour. This last is called the fastest trip on record. I will try to show that it was not. For this reason, the distance between New Orleans and Cairo, when the J. M. White ran it, was about eleven hundred and six miles. Consequently, her average speed was a trifle over fourteen miles per hour. In the Eclipse's day, the distance between the two ports had become reduced to one thousand and eighty miles. Consequently, her average speed was a shade under fourteen and three-eighths miles per hour. In the R. E. Lee's time, the distance had diminished to about one thousand and thirty miles. Consequently, her average was about fourteen and one-eighth mile per hour. Therefore, the Eclipse's was conspicuously the fastest time that has ever been made. Chapter 17. Cut-Offs and Stephen these dry details are of importance in one particular. They give me an opportunity of introducing one of the Mississippi's oddest peculiarities, that of shortening its length from time to time. If you will throw a long, pliant apple-paring over your shoulder, it will pretty fairly shape itself into an average section of the Mississippi, that is, the nine or ten hundred miles stretching from Cairo, Illinois, southward to New Orleans the same being wonderfully crooked, with a brief straight bit here and there, at wide intervals. The two hundred mile stretch from Cairo northward to St. Louis is by no means so crooked, that being a rocky country which the river cannot cut much. The water cuts the alluvial banks of the lower river into deep horseshoe curves, so deep, indeed, that in some places, if you were to get ashore at one extremity of the horseshoe and walk across the neck, half or three-quarters of a mile, you could sit down and rest a couple of hours, while your steamer was coming round the long elbow at a speed of ten miles an hour, to take you aboard again. When the river is rising fast, some scoundrel whose plantation is back in the country, and therefore of inferior value, has only to watch his chance, cut a little gutter across the narrow neck of land some dark night, and turn the water into it and in a wonderfully short time a miracle has happened. To wit, the whole Mississippi has taken possession of that little ditch, and placed the countryman's plantation on its bank, quadrupling its value, and that other party's formerly valuable plantation finds itself away out yonder on a big island, and the old watercourse around it will soon shoal up, boats cannot approach within ten miles of it, and down goes its value to a fourth of its former worth. Watches are kept on those narrow necks at needful times, and if a man happens to be caught cutting a ditch across them, the chances are all against his ever having another opportunity to cut a ditch. Pray observe some of the effects of this ditching business. Once there was a neck opposite Port Hudson, Louisiana, which was only half a mile across in its narrowest place. You could walk across there in fifteen minutes, but if you made the journey around the Cape on a raft, you travelled thirty-five miles to accomplish the same thing. In 1722 the river darted through that neck, deserted its old bed, and thus shortened itself thirty-five miles. In the same way it shortened itself twenty-five miles at Black Hawk Point in 1699. Below Red River Landing, Recursi Cut-Off was made, forty or fifty years ago, I think. This shortened the river twenty-eight miles. In our day, if you travel by river from the southernmost of these three cut-offs to the northernmost, you go about seventy miles. To do the same thing a hundred and seventy-six years ago, one had to go a hundred and fifty-eight miles, shortening of eighty-eight miles in that trifling distance. At some forgotten time in the past, cut-offs were made above Vidalia, Louisiana, at Island 92, at Island 84, and at Hales Point. These shortened the river, in the aggregate, seventy-seven miles. 
Since my own day on the Mississippi, cut-offs have been made at Hurricane Island, at Island 100, at Napoleon, Arkansas, at Walnut Bend, and at Council Bend. These shortened in the aggregate sixty-seven miles. In my own time a cut-off was made at American Bend, which shortened the river ten miles or more. Therefore the Mississippi between Cairo and New Orleans was twelve hundred and fifteen miles long one hundred and seventy-six years ago. It was eleven hundred and eighty after the cut-off of 1722. It was one thousand and forty after the American Bend cut-off. It has lost sixty-seven miles since. Consequently, its length is only nine hundred and seventy-three miles at present. Now, if I wanted to be one of those ponderous scientific people, and let on to prove what had occurred in the remote past by what had occurred in a given time in the recent past, or what will occur in the far future by what has occurred in late years, what an opportunity is here! Geology never had such a chance, nor such exact data to argue from, nor development of species, either. Glacial epochs are great things, but they are vague, vague. Please observe. In the space of one hundred and seventy-six years the lower Mississippi has shortened itself two hundred and forty-two miles. That is an average of a trifle over one mile and a third per year. Therefore any calm person who is not blind or idiotic can see that in the old oolitic Silurian period, just a million years ago next November, the lower Mississippi River was upwards of one million three hundred thousand miles long, and stuck out over the Gulf of Mexico like a fishing rod. And by the same token any person can see that seven hundred and forty-two years from now the lower Mississippi will only be a mile and three-quarters long and Cairo and New Orleans will have joined their streets together, and be plodding comfortably along under a single mayor and a mutual board of aldermen. There is something fascinating about science. One gets such wholesale returns of conjecture out of such a trifling investment of fact. When the water begins to flow through one of those ditches I have been speaking of, it is time for the people thereabouts to move. The water cleaves the banks away like a knife. By the time the ditch has become twelve or fifteen feet wide, the calamity is as good as accomplished, for no power on earth can stop it now. When the width has reached a hundred yards, the banks begin to peel off in slices half an acre wide. The current flowing around the bend travelled formerly only five miles an hour. Now it is tremendously increased by the shortening of the distance. I was on board the first boat that tried to go through the cut-off at American Bend, but we did not get through. It was toward midnight, and a wild night it was, thunder, lightning, and torrents of rain. It was estimated that the current in the cut-off was making about fifteen or twenty miles an hour. Twelve or thirteen was the best our boat could do, even in tolerably slack water, therefore perhaps we were foolish to try the cut-off. However, Mr. Brown was ambitious, and he kept on trying. The eddy running up the bank, under the point, was about as swift as the current out in the middle. So we would go flying up the shore like a lightning express train, get on a big head of steam, and stand by for a surge when we struck the current that was whirling by the point. But all our preparations were useless. The instant the current hit us, it spun us around like a top. The water deluged the forecastle, and the boat careened so far over that one could hardly keep his feet. The next instant we were away down the river, clawing with might and main to keep out of the woods. We tried the experiment four times. I stood on the forecastle companionway to see. It was astonishing to observe how suddenly the boat would spin around and turn tail the moment she emerged from the eddy, and the current struck her nose. The sounding concussion and the quivering would have been about the same if she had come full steam against a sandbank. Under the lightning flashes one could see the plantation cabins and the goodly acres tumble into the river, and the crash they made was not a bad effort at thunder. Once when we spun around we only missed a house about twenty feet that had a light burning in the window, and in the same instant that house went overboard. Nobody could stay on our forecastle. The water swept across it in a torrent every time we plunged athwart the current. At the end of our fourth effort we brought up in the woods two miles below the cut-off. All the country there was overflowed, of course. 
A day or two later the cut-off was three-quarters of a mile wide, and boats passed up through it without much difficulty, and so saved ten miles. The old Recoursey cut-off reduced the river's length twenty-eight miles. There used to be a tradition connected with it. It was said that a boat came along there in the night, and went around the enormous elbow the usual way, the pilots not knowing that the cut-off had been made. It was a grisly, hideous night, and all shapes were vague and distorted. The old bend had already begun to fill up, and the boat got to running away from mysterious reefs and occasionally hitting one. The perplexed pilots fell to swearing, and finally uttered the entirely unnecessary wish that they might never get out of that place. As always happens in such cases, that particular prayer was answered, and the others neglected. So to this day that phantom steamer is still butting around in that deserted river, trying to find her way out. More than one grave watchman has sworn to me that on drizzly dismal nights he has glanced fearfully down that forgotten river, as he passed the head of the island, and seen the faint glow of the spectre steamer's lights drifting through the distant gloom, and heard the muffled cough of her escape-pipes and the plaintive cry of her leadsman. In the absence of further statistics, I beg to close this chapter with one more reminiscence of Stephen. Most of the captains and pilots held Stephen's note for borrowed sums, ranging from two hundred and fifty dollars upward. Stephen never paid one of these notes, but he was very prompt and very zealous about renewing them every twelve months. Of course, there came a time, at last, when Stephen could no longer borrow of his ancient creditors, so he was obliged to lie and wait for new men who did not know him. Such a victim was good-hearted, simple-natured young Yates. I use a fictitious name, but the real name began, as this one does, with a Y. Young Yates graduated as a pilot, got a berth, and when the month was ended and he stepped up to the clerk's office and received his two hundred and fifty dollars in crisp new bills, Stephen was there. His silvery tongue began to wag, and in a very little while Yates' two hundred and fifty dollars had changed hands. The fact was soon known at pilot's headquarters, and the amusement and satisfaction of the old creditors were large and generous. But innocent Yates never suspected that Stephen's promise to pay promptly at the end of the week was a worthless one. Yates called for his money at the stipulated time. Stephen sweetened him up and put him off a week. He called then, according to agreement, and came away sugar-coated again, but suffering under another postponement. So the thing went on. Yates haunted Stephen, week after week, to no purpose, and at last gave it up. And then, straight away, Stephen began to haunt Yates. Wherever Yates appeared, there was the inevitable Stephen. And not only there, but beaming with affection, and gushing with apologies for not being able to pay. By and by, whenever poor Yates saw him coming, he would turn and fly, and drag his company with him, if he had company. But it was of no use. His debtor would run him down and corner him. Panting and red-faced, Stephen would come, with outstretched hands and eager eyes, invade the conversation, shake both of Yates' arms loose in their sockets, and begin. "'My, what a race I've had! I saw you didn't see me, and so I clapped on all steam for fear I'd miss you entirely. And here you are. There, just stand so, and let me look at you. Just the same old noble countenance.' To Yates' friend, "'Just look at him! Look at him! Ain't it just good to look at him? Ain't it now? Ain't he just a picture? Some call him a picture. I call him a panorama. That's what he is, an entire panorama. And now I'm reminded how I do wish I could have seen you an hour earlier. For twenty-four hours I've been saving up that two hundred and fifty dollars for you, been looking for you everywhere. I waited at the planter's from six yesterday evening till two o'clock this morning without rest or food. My wife says, Where have you been all night? I said, This debt lies heavy on my mind. She says, in all my days I never saw a man take a debt to heart the way you do. I said, It's my nature. How can I change it? She says, Well, do go to bed and get some rest. I said, Not till that poor noble young man has got his money. So I set up all night, and this morning out I shot, and the first man I struck told me you had shipped on the Grand Turk and gone to New Orleans. Well, sir, I had to lean up against a building and cry. So help me goodness, I couldn't help it. 
The man that owned the place come out cleaning up with a rag, and said he didn't like to have people cry against his building. And then it seemed to me that the whole world had turned against me, and it wasn't any use to live any more. And coming along an hour ago, suffering no man knows what agony, I met Jim Wilson and paid him the two hundred and fifty dollars on account. And to think that here you are now, and I haven't got a cent. But as sure as I am standing here on this ground, on this particular brick, there I've scratched a mark on the brick to remember it by. I'll borrow that money and pay it over to you at twelve o'clock sharp to-morrow. Now stand so. Let me look at you just once more." And so on. Yates' life became a burden to him. He could not escape his debtor, and his debtor's awful sufferings on account of not being able to pay. He dreaded to show himself in the street, lest he should find Stephen lying in wait for him at the corner. Bogart's billiard saloon was a great resort for pilots in those days. They met there about as much to exchange river news as to play. One morning Yates was there. Stephen was there, too, but kept out of sight. But by and by, when about all the pilots had arrived who were in town, Stephen suddenly appeared in the midst, and rushed for Yates as for a long-lost brother. "'Oh, I am so glad to see you! Oh, my soul, the sight of you is such comfort to my eyes! Gentlemen, I owe all of you money. Among you I owe probably forty thousand dollars. I want to pay it. I intend to pay it, every last cent of it. You all know, without my telling you, what sorrow it has cost me to remain so long under such deep obligations to such patient and generous friends. But the sharpest pang I suffer, by far the sharpest, is from the debt I owe to this noble young man here. And I have come to this place this morning especially to make the announcement that I have at last found a method whereby I can pay off all my debts. And most especially I wanted him to be here when I announced it. Yes, my faithful friend, my benefactor, I've found the method. I've found the method to pay off all my debts, and you'll get your money." Hope dawned in Yates' eye. Then Stephen, beaming benignantly, and placing his hand upon Yates' head, added, "'I am going to pay them off in alphabetical order.' Then he turned and disappeared. The full significance of Stephen's method did not dawn upon the perplexed and musing crowd for some two minutes. Then Yates murmured with a sigh, "'Well, the wise stand a gaudy chance. He won't get any further than the seas in this world, and I reckon that after a good deal of eternity has wasted away in the next one, I'll still be referred to up there as that poor ragged pilot that came here from St. Louis in the early days." Chapter 18. I Take a Few Extra Lessons During the two or two and a half years of my apprenticeship, I served under many pilots, and had experience of many kinds of steamboatmen, and many varieties of steamboats. For it was not always convenient for Mr. Bixby to have me with him, and in such cases he sent me with somebody else. I am to this day profiting somewhat by that experience for in that brief, sharp schooling I got personally and familiarly acquainted with about all the different types of human nature that are to be found in fiction, biography, or history. The fact is daily borne in upon me that the average shore employment requires as much as forty years to equip a man with this sort of an education. When I say I am still profiting by this thing, I do not mean that it has constituted me a judge of men. No, it has not done that, for judges of men are born, not made. My profit is various in kind and degree. But the feature of it, which I value most, is the zest which that early experience has given to my later reading. When I find a well-drawn character in fiction or biography, I generally take a warm personal interest in him, for the reason that I have known him before, met him on the river. The figure that comes before me oftenest, out of the shadows of that vanished time, is that of Brown, of the steamer Pennsylvania, the man referred to in a former chapter, whose memory was so good and tiresome. He was a middle-aged, long, slim, bony, smooth-shaven, horse-faced, ignorant, stingy, malicious, snarling, fault-hunting, moat-magnifying, tyrant. I early got the habit of coming on watch with dread at my heart. 
no matter how good a time I might have been having with the off-watch below, and no matter how high my spirits might be when I started aloft, my soul became lead in my body the moment I approached the pilot-house. I still remember the first time I ever entered the presence of that man. The boat had backed out from St. Louis and was straightening down. I ascended to the pilot-house in high feather, and very proud to be semi-officially a member of the executive family of so fast and famous a boat. Brown was at the wheel. I paused in the middle of the room, all fixed to make my bow, but Brown did not look around. I thought he took a furtive glance at me out of the corner of his eye, but as not even this notice was repeated, I judged I had been mistaken. By this time he was picking his way among some dangerous breaks abreast the wood-yards. Therefore it would not be proper to interrupt him, so I stepped softly to the high bench and took a seat. There was a silence for ten minutes. Then my new boss turned and inspected me deliberately and painstakingly from head to heel for about, as it seemed to me, a quarter of an hour, after which he removed his countenance, and I saw it no more for some seconds. Then it came around once more, and this question greeted me. "'Are you Horace Bixby's cub?' "'Yes, sir.' After this there was a pause and another inspection. Then, "'What's your name?' I told him. He repeated it after me. It was probably the only thing he ever forgot. For although I was with him many months, he never addressed himself to me in any other way than, "'Here!' and then his command followed. "'Where was you born?' "'In Florida, Missouri.' A pause. Then, "'Dern sight better stayed there.' By means of a dozen or so of pretty direct questions, he pumped my family history out of me. The leads were going now, in the first crossing. This interrupted the inquest. When the leads had been laid in, he resumed. "'How long have you been on the river?' I told him. After a pause, "'Where'd you get them shoes?' I gave him the information. "'Hold up your foot.' I did so. He stepped back, examined the shoe minutely and contemptuously, scratching his head thoughtfully tilting his high sugar-loaf hat well forward to facilitate the operation, then ejaculated, "'Well, I'll be dod durned and returned to his wheel. What occasion there was to be dod durned about it is a thing which is still as much of a mystery to me now as it was then. It must have been all of fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes of dull, homesick silence, before that long horse-face swung round upon me again, and then what a change! It was as red as fire, and every muscle in it was working. Now came this shriek. "'Here! Are you going to sit there all day?' I lit in the middle of the floor, shot there by the electric suddenness of the surprise. As soon as I could get my voice, I said, apologetically, "'I have had no orders, sir.' "'You've had no orders? My, what a fine bird we are! We must have orders! Our father was a gentleman, owned slaves, and we've been to school. Yes, we are gentlemen, too, and, and got to have orders. Orders, is it? Orders is what you want. Dod turn my skin! I'll learn you to swell yourself up and blow around here about your dod turned orders. Gway from the wheel! I had approached it without knowing it. I moved back a step or two, and stood as in a dream, all my senses stupefied by this frantic assault. What are you standing there for? Take that ice pitcher down to the Texas tender come. Move along, and, and don't you be all day about it." The moment I got back to the pilot-house, Brown said, "'Here, what was you doing down there all this time?' "'I couldn't find the Texas tender. I had to go all the way to the pantry.' "'Darned likely story. Fill up the stove.' I proceeded to do so. He watched me like a cat. Presently he shouted, "'Put down that shovel! Deadest numbskull I ever saw! Ain't even got sense enough to load up a stove!' All through the watch this sort of thing went on. Yes, the subsequent watches were much like it, during a stretch of months. As I have said, I soon got the habit of coming on duty with dread. The moment I was in the presence, even in the darkest night, I could feel those yellow eyes upon me, and knew their owner was watching for a pretext to spit out some venom on me. Preliminarily he would say, "'Here, take the wheel!' Two minutes later, "'Where in the nation you going to?' Pull her down! Pull her down!" After another moment, "'Say, you're going to hold her all day? Let her go! Meet her! Meet her!' 
Then he would jump from the bench, snatch the wheel from me, and meet her himself, pouring out wrath upon me all the time. George Ritchie was the other pilot's cub. He was having good times now, for his boss, George Ealer, was as kind-hearted as Brown wasn't. Ritchie had steeled for Brown the season before. Consequently, he knew exactly how to entertain himself and plague me all by the one operation. Whenever I took the wheel for a moment on Ealer's watch, Ritchie would sit back on the bench and play Brown, with continual ejaculations of, "'Snatcher! Snatcher! Darndest mud-cat I ever saw! Here! Where are you going now? Going to run over that snag? Pull her down! Don't you hear me? Pull her down! There she goes, just as I expected! I told you not to cramp that reef! Gway from the wheel!' So I always had a rough time of it, no matter whose watch it was. And sometimes it seemed to me that Ritchie's good-natured badgering was pretty nearly as aggravating as Brown's dead-earnest nagging. I often wanted to kill Brown, but this would not answer. A cub had to take everything his boss gave, in the way of vigorous comment and criticism, and we all believed that there was a United States law making it a penitentiary offense to strike or threaten a pilot who was on duty. However, I could imagine myself killing Brown. There was no law against that. And that was the thing I used always to do the moment I was abed. Instead of going over my river in my mind, as was my duty, I threw business aside for pleasure, and killed Brown. I killed Brown every night for months, not in old, stale, commonplace ways, but in new and picturesque ways, ways that were sometimes surprising for freshness of design and ghastliness of situation and environment. Brown was always watching for a pretext to find fault, and if he could find no plausible pretext, he would invent one. He would scold you for shaving a shore, or for not shaving it, for hugging a bar, and for not hugging it, for pulling down when not invited, and for not pulling down when not invited, for firing up without orders, and for waiting for orders. In a word, it was his invariable rule to find fault with everything you did. And another invariable rule of his was to throw all his remarks to you into the form of an insult. One day we were approaching New Madrid, bound down and heavily laden. Brown was at one side of the wheel steering, I was at the other, standing by to pull down or shove up. He cast a furtive glance at me every now and then. I had long ago learned what that meant, viz. He was trying to invent a trap for me. I wondered what shape it was going to take. By and by he stepped back from the wheel and said in his usual snarly way, "'Here, see if you've got gumption enough to round her to!' This was simply bound to be a success. Nothing could prevent it, for he had never allowed me to round the boat to before. Consequently, no matter how I might do the thing, he could find free fault with it. He stood back there with his greedy eye on me, and the result was what might have been foreseen. I lost my head in a quarter of a minute, and didn't know what I was about. I started too early to bring the boat around, but detected a green gleam of joy in Brown's eye, and corrected my mistake. I started round once more while too high up, but corrected myself again in time. I made other false moves, and still managed to save myself. But at last I grew so confused and anxious that I tumbled into the very worst blunder of all. I got too far down before beginning to fetch the boat around. Brown's chance was come. His face turned red with passion. He made one bound, hurled me across the house with a sweep of his arm, spun the wheel down, and began to pour out a stream of vituperation upon me, which lasted till he was out of breath. In the course of this speech he called me all the different kinds of hard names he could think of and once or twice I thought he was even going to swear, but he didn't this time. Dod darned was the nearest he ventured to the luxury of swearing, for he had been brought up with a wholesome respect for future fire and brimstone. That was an uncomfortable hour, for there was a big audience on the hurricane deck. When I went to bed that night I killed Brown in seventeen different ways, all of them new. CHAPTER Nineteen. Brown and I exchange compliments. Two trips later I got into serious trouble. Brown was steering. I was pulling down. My younger brother appeared on the hurricane deck, and shouted to Brown to stop at some landing or other a mile or so below. Brown gave no intimation that he had heard anything. 
But that was his way. He never condescended to take notice of an under-clerk. The wind was blowing. Brown was deaf, although he always pretended he wasn't, and I very much doubted if he had heard the order. If I had two heads I would have spoken, but as I had only one it seemed judicious to take care of it, so I kept still. Presently, sure enough, we went sailing by that plantation. Captain Kleinfelter appeared on the deck and said, "'Let her come round, sir. Let her come round. Didn't Henry tell you to land here?' "'No, sir. I sent him up to do it. He did come up, and that's all the good it done. The dad turned fool. He never said anything.' "'Didn't you hear him?' asked the captain of me. Of course I didn't want to be mixed up in this business, but there was no way to avoid it, so I said, "'Yes, sir.' I knew what Brown's next remark would be before he uttered it. It was, "'Shut your mouth! You never heard anything of the kind!' I closed my mouth according to instructions. An hour later Henry entered the pilot-house, unaware of what had been going on. He was a thoroughly inoffensive boy, and I was sorry to see him come, for I knew Brown would have no pity on him. Brown began straightway. "'Here! Why didn't you tell me we'd got to land at that plantation?' "'I did tell you, Mr. Brown.' "'It's a lie!' I said, "'You lie yourself. He did tell you.' Brown glared at me in unaffected surprise, and for as much as a moment he was entirely speechless. Then he shouted at me, "'I'll attend to your case in half a minute!' Then to Henry, "'And you leave the pilot-house. Out with you!' It was pilot law, and must be obeyed. The boy started out, and even had his foot on the upper step outside the door, when Brown, with a sudden access of fury, picked up a ten-pound lump of coal, and sprang after him. But I was between, with a heavy stool, and I hit Brown a good honest blow which stretched him out. I had committed the crime of crimes. I had lifted my hand against a pilot on duty. I supposed I was booked for the penitentiary sure, and couldn't be booked any sure if I went on and squared my long account with this person while I had the chance. Consequently, I stuck to him and pounded him with my fists a considerable time. I did not know how long. The pleasure of it probably made it seem longer than it really was. But in the end he struggled free and jumped up and sprang to the wheel. A very natural solicitude, for all this time here was the steamboat tearing down the river at the rate of fifteen miles an hour, and nobody at the helm. However, Eagle Bend was two miles wide at this bank full stage, and correspondingly long and deep, and the boat was steering herself straight down the middle and taking no chances. Still that was only luck. A body might have found her charging into the woods. Perceiving, at a glance, that the Pennsylvania was in no danger, Brown gathered up the big spy-glass, war-club fashion, and ordered me out of the pilot-house with more than Comanche bluster. But I was not afraid of him now, so instead of going I tarried, and criticized his grammar. I reformed his ferocious speeches for him and put them into good English, calling his attention to the advantage of pure English over the bastard dialect of the Pennsylvania collieries whence he was extracted. He could have done his part to admiration in a cross-fire of mere vituperation, of course, but he was not equipped for this species of controversy. So he presently laid aside his glass and took the wheel, muttering and shaking his head, and I retired to the bench. The racket had brought everybody to the hurricane deck and I trembled when I saw the old captain looking up from the midst of the crowd. I said to myself, "'Now I am done for!' For although, as a rule, he was so fatherly and indulgent toward the boat's family, and so patient of minor shortcomings, he could be stern enough when the fault was worth it. I tried to imagine what he would do to a cub-pilot who had been guilty of such a crime as mine, committed on a boat-guard deep with costly freight and alive with passengers. Our watch was nearly ended. I thought I would go and hide somewhere till I got a chance to slide ashore. So I slipped out of the pilot-house, and down the steps, and around to the Texas door, and was in the act of gliding within when the captain confronted me. I dropped my head, and he stood over me in silence a moment or two. Then he said impressively, "'Follow me.' I dropped into his wake. He led the way to his parlor in the forward end of the Texas. We were alone now. He closed the after-door, then moved slowly to the forward one, and closed that. He sat down. I stood before him. He looked at me some little time, then said, "'So, you have been fighting Mr. Brown?' I answered meekly, "'Yes, sir.' 
Do you know that that is a very serious matter? Yes, sir. Are you aware that this boat was plowing down the river fully five minutes with no one at the wheel? Yes, sir. Did you strike him first? Yes, sir. What with? A stool, sir. Hard? Middling, sir. Did it knock him down? He, he, he fell, sir. Did you follow it up? Did you do anything further? Yes, sir. What did you do? Pounded him, sir. Pounded him? Yes, sir. Did you pound him much, that is, severely? One might call it that, sir, maybe. I'm deuced glad of it. Uh, hark ye, never mention that I said that. You have been guilty of a great crime, and don't you ever be guilty of it again on this boat. But lay for him ashore. Give him a good sound thrashing, do you hear? I'll pay the expense. Now go, and mind you, not a word of this to anybody. Clear out with you. You've been guilty of a great crime, you whelp. I slid out, happy with the sense of a close shave and a mighty deliverance. And I heard him laughing to himself and slapping his fat thighs after I had closed his door. When Brown came off watch, he went straight to the captain, who was talking with some passengers on the boiler deck, and demanded that I be put ashore in New Orleans, and added, I'll never turn a wheel on this boat again while that club stays. The captain said, But he needn't go round when you are on watch, Mr. Brown. I won't even stay on the same boat with him. One of us has got to go ashore. Very well, said the captain. Let it be yourself, and resumed his talk with the passengers. During the brief remainder of the trip, I knew how an emancipated slave feels, for I was an emancipated slave myself. While we lay at landings, I listened to George Ealer's flute, or to his readings from his two Bibles, that is to say, Goldsmith and Shakespeare. Or I played chess with him, and would have beaten him sometimes, only he always took back his last move, and ran the game out differently. CHAPTER Twenty, A CATASTROPHE We lay three days in New Orleans, but the captain did not succeed in finding another pilot. So he proposed that I should stand a daylight watch, and leave the night watches to George Ealer. But I was afraid. I had never stood a watch of any sort by myself, and I believed I should be sure to get into trouble in the head of some chute, or ground the boat in a near cut through some bar or other. Brown remained in his place, but he would not travel with me. So the captain gave me an order on the captain of the A. T. Lacey for a passage to St. Louis and said he would find a new pilot there, and my steersman's berth could then be resumed. The Lacey was to leave a couple of days after the Pennsylvania. The night before the Pennsylvania left, Henry and I sat chatting on a freight pile on the levee till midnight. The subject of the chat mainly was one which I think we had not exploited before, steamboat disasters. One was then on its way to us, little as we suspected it. The water which was to make the steam which should cause it was washing past some point fifteen hundred miles up the river while we talked, but it would arrive at the right time and the right place. We doubted if persons not clothed with authority were of much use in cases of disaster and attendant panic, still they might be of some use, so we decided that if a disaster ever fell within our experience we would at least stick to the boat and give such minor service as chance might throw in the way. Henry remembered this afterward, when the disaster came, and acted accordingly. The Lacey started up the river two days behind the Pennsylvania. We touched at Greenville, Mississippi, a couple of days out, and somebody shouted, "'The Pennsylvania is blown up at Ship Island, and a hundred and fifty lives lost!' At Napoleon, Arkansas, the same evening, we got an extra, issued by a Memphis paper, which gave some particulars. It mentioned my brother, and said he was not hurt. Further up the river we got a later extra. My brother was again mentioned, but this time as being hurt beyond help. We did not get full details of the catastrophe until we reached Memphis. This is the sorrowful story. It was six o'clock on a hot summer morning. The Pennsylvania was creeping along north of Ship Island, about sixty miles below Memphis, on a half-head of steam towing a wood-flat, which was fast being emptied. George Ealer was in the pilot-house alone, I think. 
The second engineer and a striker had the watch in the engine-room. The second mate had the watch on deck. George Black, Mr. Wood, and my brother, clerks, were asleep, as were also Brown and the head engineer, the carpenter, the chief mate, and one striker. Captain Kleinfelter was in the barber's chair, and the barber was preparing to shave him. There were a good many cabin passengers aboard, and three or four hundred deck passengers, so it was said at the time, and not very many of them were astir. The wood being nearly all out of the flat now, Ealer rang to come ahead full steam, and the next moment four of the eight boilers exploded with a thunderous crash, and the whole forward third of the boat was hoisted toward the sky. The main part of the mass, with the chimneys, dropped upon the boat again, a mountain of riddled and chaotic rubbish, and then, after a while, a fire broke out. Many people were flung to considerable distances, and fell in the river. Among these were Mr. Wood and my brother, and the carpenter. The carpenter was still stretched upon his mattress when he struck the water seventy-five feet from the boat. Brown, the pilot, and George Black, chief clerk, were never seen or heard of after the explosion. The barber's chair, with Captain Kleinfelter in it, and unhurt, was left with its back overhanging vacancy. Everything forward of it, floor and all, had disappeared, and the stupefied barber, who was also unhurt, stood with one toe projecting over space, still stirring his lather unconsciously and saying not a word. When George Ealer saw the chimneys plunging aloft in front of him, he knew what the matter was, so he muffled his face in the lapels of his coat, and pressed both hands there tightly to keep this protection in its place, so that no steam could get to his nose or mouth. He had ample time to attend to these details while he was going up and returning. He presently landed on top of the unexploded boilers, forty feet below the former pilot-house, accompanied by his wheel and a rain of other stuff, and enveloped in a cloud of scalding steam. All of the many who breathed that steam died, none escaped. But Ealer breathed none of it. He made his way to the free air as quickly as he could, and when the steam cleared away, he returned and climbed up on the boilers again, and patiently hunted out each and every one of his chessmen and the several joints of his flute. By this time the fire was beginning to threaten. Shrieks and groans filled the air. A great many persons had been scalded, a great many crippled. The explosion had driven an iron crowbar through one man's body. I think they said he was a priest. He did not die at once, and his sufferings were very dreadful. A young French naval cadet of fifteen, son of a French admiral, was fearfully scalded, but bore his tortures manfully. Both mates were badly scalded, but they stood to their posts nevertheless. They drew the wood-boat aft, and they and the captain fought back the frantic herd of frightened immigrants till the wounded could be brought there and placed in safety first. When Mr. Wood and Henry fell in the water, they struck out for shore, which was only a few hundred yards away. But Henry presently said he believed he was not hurt. What an unaccountable error! And therefore would swim back to the boat and help save the wounded. So they parted, and Henry returned. By this time the fire was making fierce headway, and several persons who were imprisoned under the ruins were begging piteously for help. All efforts to conquer the fire proved fruitless, so the buckets were presently thrown aside, and the officers fell to with axes and tried to cut the prisoners out. A striker was one of the captives. He said he was not injured, but could not free himself, and when he saw that the fire was likely to drive away the workers, he begged that some one would shoot him, and thus save him from the more dreadful death. The fire did drive the axe-men away, and they had to listen, helpless, to this poor fellow's supplications, till the flames ended his miseries. The fire drove all into the wood-flat that could be accommodated there. It was cut adrift then, and it and the burning steamer floated down the river toward Ship Island. They moored the flat at the head of the island, and there, unsheltered from the blazing sun, the half-naked occupants had to remain without food or stimulants or help for their hurts during the rest of the day. A steamer came along, finally, and carried the unfortunates to Memphis, and there the most lavish assistance was at once forthcoming. By this time Henry was insensible. The physicians examined his injuries and saw that they were fatal, and naturally turned their main attention to patients who could be saved. Forty of the wounded were placed upon pallets on the floor of a great public hall, 
and among these was Henry. There the ladies of Memphis came every day with flowers, fruits, and dainties and delicacies of all kinds, and there they remained and nursed the wounded. All the physicians stood watches there, and all the medical students, and the rest of the town furnished money, or whatever else was wanted. And Memphis knew how to do all these things well, for many a disaster like the Pennsylvania's had happened near her doors, and she was experienced, above all other cities on the river, in the gracious office of the Good Samaritan. The sight I saw when I entered that large hall was new and strange to me. Two long rows of prostrate forms, more than forty in all, and every face and head a shapeless wad of loose raw cotton. It was a gruesome spectacle. I watched there six days and nights, and a very melancholy experience it was. There was one daily incident which was peculiarly depressing. This was the removal of the doomed to a chamber apart. It was done in order that the morale of the other patients might not be injuriously affected by seeing one of their number in the death agony. The fated one was always carried out with as little stir as possible, and the stretcher was always hidden from sight by a wall of assistance. But no matter, everybody knew what that cluster of bent forms with its muffled step and its slow movement meant, and all eyes watched it wistfully, and a shudder went abreast of it like a wave. I saw many poor fellows removed to the death-room, and saw them no more afterward. But I saw our chief mate carried thither more than once. His hurts were frightful, especially his scalds. He was clothed in linseed oil and raw cotton to his waist, and resembled nothing human. He was often out of his mind, and then his pains would make him rave and shout, and sometimes shriek. Then, after a period of numb exhaustion, his disordered imagination would suddenly transform the great apartment into a forecastle, and the hurrying throng of nurses into the crew, and he would come to a sitting posture and shout, "'Hump yourselves! Hump yourselves, you petrifactions! Snail bellies! Paul bearers! Going to be all day getting that hatful of freight out?' And supplement this explosion with a firmament obliterating eruption or profanity which nothing could stay or stop till his crater was empty. And now and then, while these frenzies possessed him, he would tear off handfuls of the cotton and expose his cooked flesh to view. It was horrible. It was bad for the others, of course, this noise and these exhibitions. So the doctors tried to give him morphine to quiet him. But in his mind, or out of it, he would not take it. He said his wife had been killed by that treacherous drug, and he would die before he would take it. He suspected that the doctors were concealing it in his ordinary medicines and in his water so he ceased from putting either to his lips. Once, when he had been without water during two sweltering days, he took the dipper in his hand, and the sight of the limpid fluid and the misery of his thirst tempted him almost beyond his strength. But he mastered himself and threw it away, and after that he allowed no more to be brought near him. Three times I saw him carried to the death-room, insensible and supposed to be dying, but each time he revived cursed his attendants, and demanded to be taken back. He lived to be mate of a steamboat again. But he was the only one who went to the death-room and returned alive. Dr. Peyton, a principal physician, and rich in all the attributes that go to constitute high and flawless character, did all that educated judgment and trained skill could do for Henry. But, as the newspapers had said in the beginning, his hurts were past help. On the evening of the sixth day his wandering mind busied itself with matters far away, and his nerveless fingers picked at his coverlet. His hour had struck. We bore him to the death-room, poor boy. CHAPTER Twenty One, A SECTION IN MY BIOGRAPHY In due course I got my license. I was a pilot now, full-fledged. I dropped into casual employments, no misfortunes resulting. Intermittent work gave place to steady and protracted engagements. Time drifted smoothly and prosperously on, and I supposed, and hoped, that I was going to follow the river the rest of my days, and die at the wheel when my mission was ended. But by and by the war came, commerce was suspended, my occupation was gone. I had to seek another livelihood, so I became a silver miner in Nevada. Next, a newspaper reporter, 
next a gold miner in California, next a reporter in San Francisco, next a special correspondent in the Sandwich Islands, next a roving correspondent in Europe and the East, next an instructional torch-bearer on the lecture platform, and finally I became a scribbler of books, and an immovable fixture among the other rocks of New England. In so few words have I disposed of the twenty-one slow-drifting years that have come and gone since I last looked from the windows of a pilot-house. Let us resume now. CHAPTER Twenty Two. I RETURN TO MY MUTTONS After twenty-one years' absence I felt a very strong desire to see the river again, and the steamboats, and such of the boys as might be left, so I resolved to go out there. I enlisted a poet for company, and a stenographer to take him down, and started westward about the middle of April. As I proposed to make notes with a view to printing, I took some thought as to methods of procedure. I reflected that if I were recognized on the river, I should not be as free to go and come, talk, inquire, and spy around, as I should be if unknown. I remembered that it was the custom of steamboat men in the old times to load up the confiding stranger with the most picturesque and admirable lies, and put the sophisticated friend off with dull and ineffectual facts. So I concluded that, from a business point of view, it would be an advantage to disguise our party with fictitious names. The idea was certainly good, but it bred infinite bother. For although Smith, Jones, and Johnson are easy names to remember when there is no occasion to remember them, it is next to impossible to recollect them when they are wanted. How do criminals manage to keep a brand-new alias in mind? This is a great mystery. I was innocent, and yet was seldom able to lay my hand on my new name when it was needed, and it seemed to me that if I had had a crime on my conscience to further confuse me, I could never have kept the name by me at all. We left per Pennsylvania Railroad at 8 a.m. April 18. Evening, speaking of dress, grace and picturesqueness drop gradually out of it as one travels away from New York. I find that among my notes. It makes no difference which direction you take. The fact remains the same, whether you move north, south, east, or west, no matter. You can get up in the morning and guess how far you have come by noting what degree of grace and picturesqueness is by that time lacking in the costumes of the new passengers. I do not mean of the women alone, but of both sexes. It may be that carriage is at the bottom of this thing, and I think it is for there are plenty of ladies and gentlemen in the provincial cities whose garments are all made by the best tailors and dressmakers of New York. Yet this has no perceptible effect upon the grand fact. The educated eye never mistakes those people for New Yorkers. No, there is a godless grace and snap and style about a born and bred New Yorker, which mere clothing cannot affect. April 19. This morning struck into the region of full goatees, sometimes accompanied by a moustache, but only occasionally. It was odd to come upon this thick crop of an obsolete and uncomely fashion. It was like running suddenly across a forgotten acquaintance whom you had supposed dead for a generation. The goatee extends over a wide extent of country, and is accompanied by an iron-clad belief in Adam and the biblical history of creation which has not suffered from the assaults of the scientists. AFTERNOON At the railway stations the loafers carry both hands in their breeches pockets. It was observable heretofore that one hand was sometimes out of doors. Here never. This is an important fact in geography. If the loafers determined the character of a country, it would be still more important, of course. Heretofore, all along, the station loafer has been often observed to scratch one shin with the other foot. Here these remains of activity are wanting. This was an ominous look. By and by we entered the tobacco-chewing region. Fifty years ago the tobacco-chewing region covered the Union. It is greatly restricted now. Next boots began to appear. Not in strong force, however. Later, away down the Mississippi, they became the rule. 
They disappeared from other sections of the Union with the mud. No doubt they will disappear from the river villages also when proper pavements come in. We reached St. Louis at ten o'clock at night. At the counter of the hotel I tendered a hurriedly invented fictitious name with a miserable attempt at careless ease. The clerk paused and inspected me in the compassionate way in which one inspects a respectable person who is found in doubtful circumstances. Then he said, "'It's all right. I know what sort of a room you want. Used to clerk at the St. James in New York.' An unpromising beginning for a fraudulent career. We started to the supper-room, and met two other men whom I had known elsewhere. How odd and unfair it is! Wicked impostors go around lecturing under my nom de guerre, and nobody suspects them. But when an honest man attempts an imposture, he is exposed at once. One thing seemed plain. We must start down the river the next day, if people who could not be deceived were going to crop up at this rate, an unpalatable disappointment, for we had hoped to have a week in St. Louis. The Southern was a good hotel, and we could have had a comfortable time there. It is large and well conducted, and its decorations do not make one cry, as do those of the vast Palmer House in Chicago. True, the billiard tables were of the old Silurian period, and the cues and balls of the post Pliocene, but there was refreshment in this, not discomfort, for there is rest and healing in the contemplation of antiquities. The most notable absence observable in the billiard-room was the absence of the river-man. If he was there, he had taken in his sign. He was in disguise. I saw there none of the swell airs and graces, and ostentatious displays of money, and pompous squanderings of it, which used to distinguish the steamboat crowd from the dry-land crowd in the bygone days, in the thronged billiard-rooms of St. Louis. In those times the principal saloons were always populous with river-men. Given fifty players present, thirty or thirty-five were likely to be from the river. But I suspected that the ranks were thin now, and the steamboat-men no longer an aristocracy. I, in my time, they used to call the barkeep Bill, or Joe, or Tom, and slap him on the shoulder. I watched for that, but none of these people did it manifestly a glory that once was had dissolved and vanished away in these twenty-one years. When I went up to my room I found there the young man called Rogers crying. Rogers was not his name, neither was Jones, Brown, Dexter, Ferguson, Bascom, nor Thompson, but he answered to either of these that a body found handy in an emergency, or to any other name, in fact, if he perceived that you meant him. He said, what is a person to do here when he wants a drink of water? Drink this slush? Can't you drink it? I could if I had some other water to wash it with. Here was a thing which had not changed. A score of years had not affected this water's mulatto complexion in the least. A score of centuries would succeed no better, perhaps. It comes out of the turbulent bank-caving Missouri, and every tumblerful of it holds nearly an acre of land in solution. I got this fact from the bishop of the diocese. If you will let your glass stand half an hour, you can separate the land from the water as easy as Genesis. And then you will find them both good. The one good to eat, the other good to drink. The land is very nourishing. The water is thoroughly wholesome. The one appeases hunger, the other thirst. But the natives do not take them separately, but together, as nature mixed them. When they find an inch of mud in the bottom of a glass, they stir it up, and then take the draught, as they would gruel. It is difficult for a stranger to get used to this batter, but once used to it, he will prefer it to water. This is really the case. It is good for steamboating, and good to drink, but it is worthless for all other purposes, except baptizing. Next morning we drove around town in the rain. The city seemed but little changed. It was greatly changed, but it did not seem so, because in St. Louis, as in London and Pittsburgh, you can't persuade a new thing to look new. The coal smoke turns it into an antiquity the moment you take your hand off it. The place had just about doubled its size since I was a resident of it, and was now become a city of four hundred thousand inhabitants. 
Still, in the solid business parts, it looked about as it had looked formerly. Yet, I am sure there is not as much smoke in St. Louis now as there used to be. The smoke used to bank itself in a dense billowy black canopy over the town, and hide the sky from view. This shelter is very much thinner now. Still, there is a sufficiency of smoke there, I think. I heard no complaint. However, on the outskirts changes were apparent enough, notably in dwelling-house architecture. The fine new homes are noble and beautiful and modern. They stand by themselves, too, with green lawns around them, whereas the dwellings of a former day are packed together in blocks, and are all of one pattern, with windows all alike, set in an arched framework of twisted stone, a sort of house which was handsome enough when it was rarer. There was another change, the forest park. This was new to me. It is beautiful and very extensive, and has the excellent merit of having been made mainly by nature. There are other parks, and fine ones, notably Tower Grove and the Botanical Gardens, for St. Louis interested herself in such improvements at an earlier day than did the most of our cities. The first time I ever saw St. Louis, I could have bought it for six million dollars, and it was the mistake of my life that I did not do it. It was bitter now to look abroad over this domed and steepled metropolis, this solid expanse of bricks and mortar stretching away on every hand into dim, measure-defying distances, and remember that I had allowed that opportunity to go by. Why I should have allowed it to go by seems, of course, foolish and inexplicable to-day, at a first glance, yet there were reasons at the time to justify this course. A Scotchman, Hon. Charles Augustus Murray, writing some forty-five or fifty years ago, said, The streets are narrow, ill-paved, and ill-lighted. Those streets are narrow still, of course, many of them are ill-paved yet, but the reproach of ill-lighting cannot be repeated now. The Catholic New Church was the only notable building then, and Mr. Murray was confidently called upon to admire it, with its species of Grecian portico, surmounted by a kind of steeple, much too diminutive in its proportions, and surmounted by sundry ornaments, which the unimaginative Scotchman found himself quite unable to describe, and therefore was grateful when a German tourist helped him out with the exclamation, "By, they look exactly like bedposts. St. Louis is well equipped with stately and noble public buildings now, and the little church, which the people used to be so proud of, lost its importance a long time ago. Still, this would not surprise Mr. Murray, if he could come back for he prophesied the coming greatness of St. Louis with strong confidence. The further we drove in our inspection tour, the more sensibly I realized how the city had grown since I had seen it last. Changes in detail became steadily more apparent and frequent than at first, too. Changes uniformly evidencing progress, energy, prosperity. But the change of changes was on the levee. This time, a departure from the rule. Half a dozen sound-asleep steamboats, where I used to see a solid mile of wide-awake ones. This was melancholy. This was woeful. The absence of the pervading and jocund steamboat man from the billiard saloon was explained. He was absent because he is no more. His occupation is gone. His power has passed away. He is absorbed into the common herd. He grinds at the mill, a shorn Samson and inconspicuous. Half a dozen lifeless steamboats, a mile of empty wharves, a negro fatigued with whiskey stretched asleep, in a wide and soundless vacancy, where the serried hosts of commerce used to contend. Footnote. Captain Marriott, writing forty-five years ago, says, St. Louis has twenty thousand inhabitants. The river abreast of the town is crowded with steamboats lying in two or three tiers. Here was desolation indeed. The old, old sea, as one in tears, comes murmuring with foamy lips, and knocking at the vacant piers, calls for his long-lost multitude of ships. The towboat and the railroad had done their work, and done it well and completely. 
The mighty bridge, stretching along over our heads, had done its share in the slaughter and spoliation. Remains of former steamboatmen told me, with wan satisfaction, that the bridge doesn't pay. Still, it can be no sufficient compensation to a corpse to know that the dynamite that laid him out was not of as good quality as it had been supposed to be. The pavements along the river front were bad. The sidewalks were rather out of repair. There was a rich abundance of mud. All this was familiar and satisfying, but the ancient armies of drays and struggling throngs of men and mountains of freight were gone, and Sabbath reigned in their stead. The immemorial mile of cheap foul doggeries remained, but business was dull with them. The multitudes of poison-swilling Irishmen had departed, and in their places were a few scattering handfuls of ragged negroes, some drinking, some drunk, some nodding, others asleep. St. Louis is a great and prosperous and advancing city, but the river-edge of it seems dead past resurrection. Mississippi steamboating was born about 1812. At the end of thirty years it had grown to mighty proportions, and in less than thirty more it was dead. A strangely short life for so majestic a creature. Of course it is not absolutely dead. Neither is a crippled octogenarian who could once jump twenty-two feet on level ground. But, as contrasted with what it was in its prime vigor, Mississippi steamboating may be called dead. It killed the old-fashioned keel-boating by reducing the freight trip to New Orleans to less than a week. The railroads have killed the steamboat passenger traffic by doing in two or three days what the steamboats consumed a week in doing, and the towing fleets have killed the through-freight traffic by dragging six or seven steamer-loads of stuff down the river at a time, at an expense so trivial that steamboat competition was out of the question. Freight and passenger-way traffic remains to the steamers. This is in the hands, along the two thousand miles of river between St. Paul and New Orleans, of two or three close corporations well fortified with capital, and by able and thoroughly businesslike management and system, these make a sufficiency of money out of what is left of the once prodigious steamboating industry. I suppose that St. Louis and New Orleans have not suffered materially by the change, but alas for the woodyard man! He used to fringe the river all the way. His close-ranked merchandise stretched from the one city to the other, along the banks, and he sold uncountable cords of it every year for cash on the nail. But all the scattering boats that are left burn coal now, and the seldomest spectacle on the Mississippi today is a woodpile. Where now is the once woodyard man?